We're live. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to um, Tilsonburg Town Council meeting, March 27th. We have a full house. I welcome everyone. Just remind everyone to please um, keep silent when others are speaking. Um, we're going to be doing a bunch of planning matters and um, whether you're in favor of or opposed of, there will be opportunities to speak and I will indicate those times that are available. Um, Today we recognize the Indigenous peoples as the customary keepers and defenders of the Great Turtle Island, its waters and its lands. We honor their long history and welcoming others to this beautiful territory. Our aim is to uphold and uplift their voices and values as a host nation. Now we'll turn to the adoption of the agenda. Councillor Parsons. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Luciani, that the agenda is prepared for the council meeting on March 27th. 2023 be approved. Thank you. Thank you. I just, uh, before I ask if there's any questions, just remind councillors, um, we don't usually speak as close into our mics, but we could speak closer into our microphones tonight so that the um, speakers in the hallway will adequately carry our voices. So does council have any questions regarding the agenda? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor is agenda prepared and that is carried. Disclosures of pecuniary interest and general nature thereof. Seeing none, we move to the adoption of council minutes of the previous meeting, Councillor Rosehart. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Spencer. At the council meeting held minute, council meeting minutes dated March 13, 2023, be approved. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, concerns, errors, omissions? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that is carried as well. Now we're moving to uh, public meetings. It's an application for official plan amendment, draft plan of subdivision known as Victoria Woods. This is a public meeting held under the Planning Act for the purpose of hearing zone change application ZN7-22-05. This process allows any person in attendance the opportunity to speak to the application. If anyone who appeals this decision has not provided council with oral or written submissions at the public meeting, then the local planning appeal tribunal has the power to dismiss the appeal. If you speak to the applications, please state your name and sign your name and street address at a sheet located at the podium. The planner will now give us an overview of the zone change application. So I'll turn it over to Eric. Thank you. Oh, before um, I do that, I just wanna welcome back Sheena. And I would also like to say the deputy mayor is absent because he is on town business this evening. So Eric, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, these are applications for official plan amendment, uh, draft plan of subdivision approval and zone change. Uh, the official plan amendment would revise the boundary of the present high and medium density designations. It would also provide for the creation of an additional medium density residential block. And the zone change uh, proposes a number of site-specific residential zones uh, to facilitate the proposed subdivision plan. Uh, the lands are south of Concession Street, west west of uh, Quarter Town Line, and have frontage on uh, Quarter Town Line, Concession Street, west, uh, the end of Esseltine Drive, uh, the future extension of Durham Drive, Grandview Drive, as well as uh, Western Drive to the south. The Proposed plan of subdivision will consist of 26 blocks for single detached dwellings, three blocks for a mix of single detached dwellings and townhouse dwellings, two blocks for townhouse dwellings, uh, two blocks for medium density development, and one block for high density residential development. Uh, it also includes one park block, uh, two blocks for stormwater management, uh, three walkway, uh, walkway blocks, uh, all served by nine new local streets and extensions of Esseltine Drive, Durham Drive, and Grandview Drive. Uh, at this time, the exact uh, composition of the residential units is not known, but the range of units that could be accommodated uh, ranges from 699 at the low end uh, up to 1,113 uh, if all the lands are developed uh, as per the maximum permitted density. In support of the applications, a functional servicing report a planning justification report, uh, archaeological assessment report, environmental impact study, a transportation impact study, 
and the geotechnical and slope stability report were also submitted. The lands are 110 acres with 15.3 of those acres being located outside of the town boundary in the township of South West Oxford. Uh, these planning applications this evening are only applicable uh, to the lands within the town of Tilsonburg. The plan was originally submitted in uh, 20, uh, July of 2022, uh, and there was a number of revisions made in response to uh, comments uh, provided by staff, uh, including a revised uh, parkland layout, uh, revised uh, location of a medium density block, as well as uh, revised uh, street network and some additional pedestrian connections. The requested uh, zoning uh, uh, provisions, I'll just put in the report starting at uh, page 10 or page eight, sorry. Uh, but I'll just give you a, a brief summary of those for the high density block. It's proposed to also include some non-residential uses, including a daycare, a health office, a personal service establishment, convenience store, drugstore, and coffee shop, uh, as well as allow for a multiple unit dwelling in the form of a stacked townhouse uh, to provide relief of the required children's outdoor play area and provide reduced setback between apartment buildings on the same lot. Uh, for the medium density blocks uh, on the north uh, part of the plan, uh, as well, there are the same uh, provisions have been uh, requested, including uh, and limited non-residential uses consisting of a daycare, a health office, a personal service establishment, convenience store, drugstore, and coffee shop, as well as reduced uh, setback between uh, buildings on the property. Uh, also reduced uh, minimum lot area per dwelling unit for, for multiple unit and apartment dwellings, uh, reduced uh, front yard for multiple unit dwellings and apartment dwellings, reduced exterior side yard width, rear yard depth, an interior side yard width. For the uh, special low density three zone, uh, which would permit a single detached dwelling as well as subject to the R2 pr provisions, there's also relief requested for townhouses to reduce the minimal lot area uh, for both interior and end units, uh, reduce the lot area for corner lots, reduce the lot frontages for interior end and um, and units on corner lots, uh, reduce the front yard depth from six meters to 4.5 meters for the main building, but maintaining the six meters for the where there's an attached garage. Uh, so that will ensure that you can still provide uh, at least one parking stall uh, in the uh, driveway. Uh, and the, the parking space requirements are 5.5 meters. So that six meters uh, will provide for an addition will provide for the required parking, as well as there's an increase to the maximum printed lot coverage uh, to 55%. And then for the R2 lots, or for the R2 zone properties, uh, Fox 20 and 21, which would abut uh, Baldwin Place, a uh, minimum lot frontage of 12.1 meters is proposed to be required, which is greater than the 10.5 meters uh, that's required in the regular R2 zone. Uh, reducing the minimum lot area for a corner lot from 450 square meters to 360 square meters, reducing the minimum lot frontage for a corner lot from 15 meters to 12 meters, and the same reduction in the front yard depth for the main building. So the main building could be 4.5 meters from the street line, but where the garage is and the parking space would have to maintain the six meters. Uh, the Comments received from the uh, county and town agencies and the conservation authority are detailed in the report and uh, the conditions that they have requested are included as proposed conditions of approval. Uh, the school board did note that uh, there be a clause included in the subdivision agreement, uh, which would say that uh, if there is not enough school capacity in the area, the land, the uh, students would be designated as a holding zone and they could be assigned to any school in town. So just because they live in that area, for example, wouldn't guarantee that they would uh, attend uh, Westfield Public School if there are capacity constraints, uh, which is a standard clause uh, in the 
the Thames Valley District School Board has asked for uh, throughout throughout the county, but that would give notice to future um, purchasers that they, their children may not uh, attend Westfield if uh, there is not to, if there's not capacity uh, within that school. Uh, notice of complete application was provided on J July 27th, 2022, and a notice of public meeting was uh, issued on March 13th. And uh, I, we have we have received and councils received concerns uh, from the public respecting traffic density and land use compatibility from residents from uh, adjacent developments. With respect to the uh, overall appropriateness of the planning applications, uh, staff want to highlight that the proposed uh, traffic impact study was prepared by uh, Paradigm Transportation Solutions. Uh, it did identify a number of improvements that would be required uh, on Quarter Town Line and Broadway and Concession Street, uh, uh, specifically from this development. And there's proposed conditions of approval that that be required, uh, be implemented uh, prior to the subdivision be uh, finally approved, uh, as well as there are other um, recommendations. Uh, that would occur uh, whether this development uh, move forward or not. So uh, those recommendations are within the study. Uh, the applicant submitted an environmental impact study as there was, uh, uh, there is significant valley lands and woodlands on the property and the property is within 50 meters of fish habitat. The study was peer reviewed um, and there are a number of recommendations that are required. Uh, to be implemented again through the conditions of draft approval including compensation for the area to be uh, removed a tree protection plan to be submitted uh, depicting the size species and condition of trees to be removed and trees to be protected uh, requirements on location of fill and stockpiling of soil uh, during certain calendar periods uh, to for the protection of uh, bank swallows uh, monitoring of tree health for at least nine months following post-construction to identify problems that may surface following construction, a requirement for chain link fencing along rear lot lines that are adjacent to natural heritage features, as well as the development of educational uh, homeowner brochure for lots that would back onto the Southern uh, natural heritage feature, as well as uh, the hedgerows. Again, these conditions are, or these recommendations are included as a condition of draft approval. The applicants submitted a functional servicing report indicating uh, how the property can be serviced uh, through water uh, to the presence of existing water means and uh, their extensions as well as sanitary servicing. Uh, the stormwater management uh, for the site will have uh, two ponds, one on the north, uh, just north of Westfield, which will handle the northern portion of the draft plan, and the other to the south, which would handle uh, the balance of the lands. Uh, with respect to the official plan amendment, the uh, subject property at the northern uh, portion up, uh, abutting Concession Street uh, West uh, has two existing designations. Uh, one is high density and one is medium density. Uh, those have been in place since at least uh, the 1975 uh, Oxford County official plan. Uh, the, the applicant's proposing to change the location slightly and the size slightly of those two designations. Uh, to fit the uh, proposed road network. As well as there's an additional um, medium density block uh, proposed uh, immediately west of uh, the Westfield Public School property. Uh, and then the uh, parkland block would be west of that additional uh, medium medium density uh, block. Uh, staff opinion that this additional proposed density block, medium density block, will be appropriately buffered from low density residential development, uh, will be adequately serviced, and will have access to uh, Esseltine Drive to the south and Durham Drive to the north. And it's sufficiently large to provide the required parking and amenity areas. The development of that block will likely be subject to site plan control, uh, where uh, town and county staff will have an opportunity to review the proposed plan uh, with respect to uh, servicing, uh, landscaping, uh, buffering, fencing, block grading, and other technical matters. 
Uh, with respect to the proposed street network, the extension of or Esseltown Drive and uh, the uh, Western Drive were identified in the official plan as uh, collector roads. And the, uh, the road widths of these two roads are 22 meters, which is greater than the typical 20 meter uh, right away width. So uh, staff have the opinion that the access uh, to these planned uh, collector roads is appropriate, as well as uh, Durham Drive uh, was designed as well to be a, a collector road and will be sufficiently large to, pr to provide the uh, required sanitary outlet um, and, uh, and stormwater conveyance. The exact location and mix of dwelling types has not been uh, determined as I indicated. Uh, they'll have to be declared and determined uh, prior to the submission of the detailed engineering design drawings. Uh, however, you know, based on the medium and maximum uh, density requirements, uh, the high density block on the north uh, along Concession Street is expected to accommodate anywhere from 200 to 355 residential units, and the medium blocks would accommodate uh, 121 to 239 units. Uh, within the lower res the low dense residential area, which is the most of the plan, uh, particularly the southern portion of the plan, it would include a mix of single detached dwellings, semi detached, and uh, street fronting townhouse dwellings, uh, which is permitted in the low density residential policies. The uh, staff are of the opinion that at, at this time it's appropriate to uh, rezone those portions uh, to the proposed zoning as the uh, dwelling types are permitted in the low density designation policies. Uh, with respect to the proposed zoning, staff have some concern with the uh, commercial uh, uses in the high, high and medium density blocks, specifically um, the office use and the, um, the drugstore use. The convenience store, daycare, personal service establishment, an eating establishment exclusive of a drive through uh, can be considered appropriate neighborhood serving uses, uh, which are permitted in the, in the residential areas. However, the, uh, in light of the strong policy direction in the official plan, the direct retail uses and office uses to the central area, um, and given the proximity of this property uh, to the downtown, and given the absence of detailed floor plans and unit sizes, uh, staff recommend that the proposed medical center and drugstore not be approved at this time. The reductions to the minimum distance between buildings can be considered appropriate as the Ontario Building Code is a more appropriate uh, way to regulate the separation between buildings. And again, the development of, of these blocks will be subject to site plan control. The reductions to the minimum lot area per unit will allow for increased density. However, the applicant has not requested any parking relief. So they will have to meet uh, the parking requirements of the zone, zoning bylaw, which is 1.5 uh, spaces per unit. The zoning provisions for the, the street front townhouse blocks in both the medium density uh, zones and the R3 zones will provide for increased building envelopes and smaller townhouse blocks of four units and will affect uh, other townhouse blocks uh, approved and developed in the town in the last five years, specifically in uh, Andrews Crossing uh, and Northcrest phase one and phase two. The uh, Most of the relief requested really boils down to uh, making the lot smaller from eight units uh, blocks to four unit blocks. So you have two more corner units, so it typically requires more area. The uh, reduced lot frames, lot area, and interior side yard width uh, will still provide for uh, the two parking spaces divided to for each unit, one in the driveway, one in the private attached garage. And uh, uh, through the uh, driveway widths, there's opportunity to, to get, uh, in some cases, to get two parking spaces side by side for the townhouse units. The zoning provisions for the single attached dwellings will permit a reduced lot frontage and area for corner lots but would require a larger frontage of 12.2 meters rather than the 10.5 meters for lots that back onto Baldwin Place. Uh, reduced front yard depths are proposed. However, I've noted before that reduced front yard depth only applies to the main building 
the garage will still maintain the required six meter uh, front yard depth to ensure that the parking is provided on site and the private driveway. And it's the same. It's the same as the one point five meter projection that's permitted for a covered porch. So uh, without this provision, only a covered porch would be allowed to be at four point five meters. This will allow any part of the main building, uh, if you don't have a covered porch, to be at four point five meters, but would still maintain the six meters uh, uh, to the parking area and the garage. Uh, at this time, as there are no individual lot lines being uh, created, uh, the development will be reviewed by building and planning staff for zoning compliance, both at time of building permit submission, as well as it's typical, it's likely that the lots will be created through the exemption to part lot control, um, which was how uh, Baldwin Place was developed and a number of other places in town have been developed. Um, so uh, the zoning review and zoning check will happen uh, through that uh, that process. Um, overall, staff are satisfied that the proposed development is consistent with the uh, provincial policy statement and supports the initiatives and objectives of the official plan and recommend approval subject to the noted conditions in the report. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Eric. Now I will um, open it up to councillors to question the planner. Councillor Rosar. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you to Eric. Eric, is there a reason why we're not putting any uh, roundabouts in any of the subdivisions that we do? In a lot of the cities right now, that that seems to be favorable, so it slows down traffic. Thank you, Mrs. Mayor. We have approved roundabouts in, um, I think, Linpop Phase 2, or phase, phase 1 or Phase 2, North and North Street. There's a roundabout at a intersection of two collector roads. Um, at this point, it's kind of been developer driven. I don't think town staff have identified a preference for roundabouts, but that's something that we could look to in the future. Thank you. Just to remind the council, speak, uh, speak up and speak directly into the mics. Would you like to continue, Councillor Rosart? No, thank you. Um, I do think that Councillor Rosehart raised a good point because when we're building developments out like this, there's a lot of traffic, there's a lot of houses, and we have to look at traffic calming measures within those streets as well. Um, you know, there's been errors done in the past, and and now we're we're reeling from increased volume and traffic complaints. So I, I do think that that's a valid point. Any other questions? to Eric? No? Okay. I will then. Um, so on page 25, sorry, I just uh, got to get my computer screen there. Um, it's special medium density and it's blocks 33 and 34. And it says that the maximum number of dwelling units per multiple unit dwelling not apply to any stacked houses or back to back townhouses. So now in my research, um, am I correct in saying, Eric, that um, it would be eight dwelling units per building is what normally the code speaks to? For a street funding townhouse, yeah, the typical has been eight units. After that, the building code requirements for fire separation uh, become significantly more difficult. Okay, so in this proposal, um, it's asking for an unlimited number. And so number one, I question, okay, obviously there's a fire code issue, which you just raised. Secondly, um, how does this qualify for medium density if it's an unlimited number of units? The zoning for that block would still set out um, a minimum lot area per unit. Um, so if you have, if the, the block say is um, a thousand square meters, uh, each unit requires 100 square meters. You can only fit 10 without coming back to council for a increase in the, or a decrease in the minimum lot area per unit. So um, the density isn't necessarily captured by the number of maximum number of units per building, it's also captured by the law area requirements. 
Okay, maybe that's a question I'll ask to the planner to or the um for the applicant once they get up here. Um, water. So the county, I did I did see that there's provisions um in here that certain stages of the development will be dependent on the study from the county. Um, the study of the county is that looking only at residential. I'm not overly familiar with it. I think it was um um put together before I got on the county council. Is it looking at residential, is it looking at the entire town? And part of my concern is, do we have enough water for industrial moving forward? So how do developments like this affect our future industrial growth? Will this all be determined in that study? The county is undertaking a water and wastewater master plan. So the master plan looks at uh, both like all water users, so residential, commercial, industrial, institutional, as well uh, for for South Oxford, or Southern Oxford, um, there is a long-term proposed water in interconnection between uh, Norwich, Otterville, Springford, and then connecting into Tilsonburg uh, through the county-owned uh, former railway lands um, on off of Cranberry. So the intention is to link uh, all three water supplies together to provide additional redundancies uh, through the transportation master plan, or sorry, water wastewater master plan. Uh, they're also identifying uh, additional needs for water storage. So the, the county is looking at an additional potential water storage source um, on the southern portion of the downtown to provide uh, water supply for firefighting purposes, which uh, long term could be a concern. Um, so it is on the radar, I believe, the, the master plan is supposed to come back uh, to County Council, I believe, second or third quarter of this year for review and approval. Thank you. Um, so just to clarify, though, then those phases cannot proceed forward until we're absolutely 100% sure that the water capacity exists. Is that correct? Yes, there's a condition in the draft approvals. I do remember reading it. Yeah, uh, prior to. Condition number 20, prior to their final approval of subdivision plan, the owner shall receive confirmation from the County of Oxford Public Works that there's sufficient capacity and that also bring water and wastewater or sanitary sewer systems. So how that is operationalized is prior to um, the sign off of the final subdivision plan for registration. Um, but an applicant or developer has to provide a letter from Oxford County Public Works saying that uh, there is sufficient water capacity for that phase that they're registering. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I did see the school board comments. I uh, can't say I'm, you know, and in the next report we have Southridge School is full. This report says Westfield School, so I'm not really sure where they're going to shuffle the students to. So um, that is a concern. And just from a planning perspective, I think we should need to raise awareness to it. Um, I've never seen comments from THI. So does THI ever provide agency comments? Uh, typically, they only provide comments at the detailed design. Um, they're circulated at the draft plan application stage, and they keep it, they have a running tally of projects uh, that are coming up to happen, um, but they typically don't provide comments at this stage. It's more of the, the detailed design to get involved. Okay, so just raising awareness to it, um, I would be concerned about capacity um, as we, you know, have been having those discussions. So I guess that will be flushed out through that next stage then. Um, does anyone else from council have any questions to the planner? Councilor Parker? Just further to that uh, last question. Just further to that last question, Eric, uh, with THI not providing comments now, um, have they reviewed the application in full and do they believe that there's enough hydro to support this development? I've spoken to um, the hydro tech, uh, Derek, and he's aware of the like, these three subdivisions tonight happening at the same time. Um, they don't have specific capacity concerns, but it, the capacity is on a first come, first serve basis. So if, if one developer comes forward and 
uh, registers first. Stuart, sorry, Lord, please, I really need everyone to remain quiet so we can get through these questions and move forward. Thank you. And if it comes to light that there isn't enough capacity for another plan, then that other plan may not receive the capacity first. But at a high level, they didn't express concern. Uh, they didn't express concerns with the overall number of units. Follow up, uh, Mayor Gilvesi to Eric. So I, I guess I have some concerns with that, especially from the on the development side. The developers put the money into putting their plan together and everything like that, and we're not doing a review of the hydro capacity before this goes forward. That to me, that's a concern um, because it, regardless if this is to go through or not. Um, I think that all that information needs to be made available during the planning process moving forward, because um, I would, for any developer moving forward, not just this one, is... I'm going to defer to later on to the applicant's agent uh, from CJDL who deals more directly with Oswald Hydro. Councillor Spencer? Through you, Mayor Turek. Um, I noticed a small portion on there about public consultation, clearly. <laughs> We've got a lot of public here. Um, I, I, I was given a book about Baldwin Place uh, by somebody from Baldwin Place, and the third word in it is adult community. And I'm just wondering, when there's planning, how much consideration is given to that? Um, because I don't think this is a case of nimbyism and not wanting, you know, this development or development in general, but just not to change the rules halfway through the game. So I'm just um, asking how much of the public consultation has weight when doing the planning process. Um, this is just a question as a new councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Councillor Spencer's question. So generally, if there's incompatible land uses, um, we certainly work hard to um, mitigate those and provide compatibility. Generally, residential residential isn't considered uh, incompatible land use. Um, we're not allowed to zone for the type of people who occupy the dwellings. We can just zone for the dwellings. Uh, typically, uh, low density development, abutting low density de residential development, uh, wouldn't be considered incompatible. So you could have a Two story next to a one story. Um, the developer in this case hasn't asked for relief to um, construct dwellings taller than the 11 meters that's permitted in the R2 zone. Um, and in this case, they have uh, agreed or they have in, uh, introduced um, a greater lot fringe than, than what would be required. So they are potentially losing a couple of lots because of the additional two and a half meters for those two blocks. Um, given that staff don't believe there's really a compatibility issue between the two uses. Further. Uh, thank you. Um, the point I think I'm trying to make and the concern is that this is an adult community, right? And like they're given two resident or two adults uh, per residence. There's no children residing in there. Many of them have moved from all over Ontario under the premise of this being their new community, adult community. So to open it up to families where children would be playing right beside them, that sort of thing, that's not put into consideration or it's just the residential zoning? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's just the residential zoning. Um, those stipulations in Baldwin Place are private covenants that the town has no control over. Uh, the county did not require so it's it's a private agreement between uh the all of the landowners um as such we don't really get involved with, with uh and on that that aspect of it thank you anyone else have questions for the planner seeing none we will um now there is an opportunity for the public, the applicant or agent to speak in favor of the application. So anyone in favor? Um, Andrew, are you speaking or? Okay, welcome.
use the mouse to scroll down. Okay, yeah, thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of council, and everyone here from the public. I'll do my best to speak loudly, and I understand those in the hall probably can't see the presentation, so I'll also try my best to describe what we're showing on the screen. Um, my name is Andrea Sinclair. I'm a planner with MHPC Planning here in support of the application. Um, we've reviewed all of the comments that have come through the circulation. We have also um, viewed the presentation that was before council two weeks ago, and I will do my best to address um, some of those concerns as I work through this presentation. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so, this has already been mentioned by Mr. Gilbert, but what we wanted to just set out with is what's the existing planning framework, because that really informed a lot of the design for this subdivision. So right now the lands are already designated for residential purposes. They have been um, since this version of the official plan was put in place. And then further to that, the lands are further designated with a mix of high density, medium density, and low density residential. So you'll see sort of the um, darker purple color at the top along concession is high density. The, I'll call it the pinkish color is the medium density uh, and the rest intended to be more low density. So you can see that in the official plan, the density was really con concentrated to the north of the property along concession street. You'll also see um, it's a symbol that looks like a picnic table that indicates that a park was intended to be provided within this property. Further, the official plan designates various types of roads. So the roads, the majority of roads within the Baldwin Place community are considered local roads. That's the black lines. But what you'll see on this is that Esseltine Drive, um, Weston Drive, and Durham Drive are all designated collector roads with the intent that these would provide, uh, would be extended to the west. And then some of the other surrounding roads, Concession, Quarter Town, uh, line, Newell Road, and Baldwin Street, they're all designated arterials. So collector and arterials is where the majority of traffic is supposed to go to avoid having um, large amounts of traffic on the local road system. So those existing official plan inform several of the key design elements of the proposed draft plan, as I'll walk through this evening. So Similar to the official plan, the medium and high density residential has been focused to the north of the subdivision, where it will be accessed out to Concession Street and weighting that density further to the north uh, as directed by the OP. We've provided a park. You'll see that in this subdivision, it's actually shifted more to the south, um, closer to the school and more central. That was at a direct uh, response to the park department's comments that wanted one larger park central to the neighborhood. So in earlier versions of the draft plan, we actually had two smaller parks uh, spread out, but this was revised in response to those comments. Uh, the extension of Esseltine Drive to the west, um, you'll see that in the official plan schedule, which is shown left of screen, it actually shows it going right out to the urban boundary. We've um, not extended it to the urban boundary with the hopes that Durham Drive will provide a little bit more of that collector function and Esseltine will be a little bit more of a local road, even though it is um, designated collector. And that's in large part because of the way Baldwin Place developed with a number of driveways coming out to Esseltine. And we know that there's more ability for conflict um, when that happens. So the um, what we've tried to do is minimize the number of additional driveways that'll be on this street by providing the park frontage and the medium density block, which will only have one access out to Esseltine, um, if any at all. And then having the um, connection from Weston Drive. So again, this is in the designation, in the official plan as a designated uh, collector that was intended to extend. We had an earlier version of the draft plan where that extension, the road connection was further south and that was moved um, further north to avoid removal of the hedgerow feature and to preserve as many of the trees along the western boundary as possible. So the location of where we've got that um, road sub extending to the west is a direct result of what our environmental consultants recommended. 
Uh, as Eric mentioned, we've um, the official plan amendment would add an additional medium density block. This is really intended to provide um, like a cluster townhouse development. It could be bungalow towns, um, townhouses that are in more of a condominium format uh, and located close to the school. So it provides access for um, those families. And that's just to provide a little bit of um, additional dens density central to the plan, um, while most of the lands to the south are a lower density intent. So uh, just going through some of the merits of the application in terms of planning merits. This application does uh, include a full range of housing types and a mix of housing sizes. And that is important in terms of affordability, allowing people to age in place and allowing there to be more than one housing type available. The subdivision has been designed to encourage walkability and I'll, I'll get to all these points in more detail. Uh, it's been designed as a complete community the natural features have been protected and retained where possible and where there is going to be any removals, compensation planting is going to be required. And the result of this being that when this development is fully built out, we expect there to be a significantly increased number of trees on the property when compared to what's there currently. Um, the design of the road network actually has been designed to disperse traffic and slow it down. And I'll, I'll get into that in a bit more detail because I know there are a lot of traffic concerns tonight. The design of the subdivision has been done with consideration to the existing surrounding development, and I'm talking specifically about those lots that directly back onto the subdivision, and again, we'll get into that in more detail. And the design of the subdivision has evolved in response to circulation comments. So in terms of the full range of housing types and a mix of housing sizes, um, I don't want to repeat too much what's already been said by Mr. Gilbert. So there is, uh, the proposal includes low density residential uses, such as single detached street townhouses. Um, the medium and high density blocks will allow for a full range of multiple dwellings, including towns, um, bungalow towns, stacked town homes and apartments. And again, having a full range of housing types does help to address housing affordability and allows people to stay in their neighborhoods longer and i'll maybe just on this point just before i forget um madam mayor had the question about um the number of units per block that was really only um because the zoning bylaw currently only contemplates a street townhouse type of model so if you picture uh, something like a back-to-back -back, you would probably have those eight units and then eight in behind so it would be 16 not eight otherwise you'd be designing little blocks of four which um doesn't really make sense so we can take a look at that and, and certainly put in a maximum for those other types. It wasn't the intent that we would have an endlessly long block of, of units. It's more just that the zoning doesn't quite contemplate the types of uses that we're now seeing more demand for as people are finding the single detached and the street towns are out of their price point. So um, that's certainly something we'll take away tonight. And I think we can address a maximum per block. Uh, in terms of walkability, and it's, it might be hard to see, but what we've done here is the Central Park, and then you'll see a white sort of dash circle, as well as the two parks in Baldwin Place, we've applied the same. So that white circle indicates a typical five-minute walking distance. So this just is to, intended to show that all of the residents of this development, as well as a number of the residents and surrounding developments, will be within a five-minute walk of a public park. Also shown on this diagram in yellow is sort of the trail sidewalk walkway system that will allow for various trail loops and connectivity throughout the plan and out to some of the surrounding trail networks. So each of the swim blocks are being designed to have a trail loop within them. Um, the south swim block and apologies as the plan is oriented kind of the wrong orientation, but the right side of the screen is south, um, is also intended to have trail connections out to the rail trail to the south. In terms of complete community, some of the comments we heard through circulation was that there should have been some commercially designated lands within this area. Um, the official plan has designated everything as residential, but we saw the potential along Concession Street that there may be um, the desire to have some commercial uses. That's why the zoning we proposed has had some limited commercial uses so that in down the road when those blocks develop, if someone wants to do mixed use or they want to do you know, a small coffee shop or a convenience store that they could do some of those commercial uses, recognizing that there's um, not a lot in this immediate area. So that's something we thought would help make this more of a complete community. 
um, as well, but there's going to be um, the park within this neighborhood, trail connections, walkway clock connections, and we are adjacent to an existing school. In terms of the um, natural features, so the most significant being the woodlot at the south end of the plan, that's proposed to be um, retained. There's a significant hedgerow along the sort of southwest boundary. You'll see that that's sort of the green stripe there. Um, what we've done is through the application, we've um, amended the zoning. So the rear of those lots will be a split zone where the last, um, I believe it's five or 10 meters is zoned open space so that no one can uh, put in a pool or a shed and that hedgerow is all going to be uh, retained, but also new plantings added. Um, similarly, there's a hedgerow at the edge of the school property between the school and the subdivision. Uh, part of the location of that multiple block there is because within a multiple block, you have a lot of flexibility to do things like retain hedgerows and trees because it can just be a common element within that um, multiple block. So we fully intend on preserving that hedgerow. It's sort of on the boundary of the school and our property. And at one point we had the park up against the school, but actually because of the hedgerow flipped it the other way because it's um can be a bit of a issue when you have a public park and you've got a really dense hedgerow of people kind of loitering in there and, and not having a lot of visibility. Uh, and then likewise, the hedgerow at the edge of what I'm calling the North Swim Block, um, all best efforts to retain that feature as well. So this is all um, set out in draft approval conditions where we have to do more detailed tree management plans, but it is our intent to um, preserve as much of these features and mature trees as possible. And then this is just really showing kind of all of the open space blocks um, between the stormwater management, the park that's associated with the school, the proposed park, um, and the hedgerows and trail connections. Uh, in terms of the road network uh, and how it's been designed. So as everyone's, I, I think, aware, there are multiple connections out to the existing community. Um, we have a road connection at the north to concession and then there's uh, four connections that are sort of to the east. And having a number of road connections like this actually disperses traffic a lot more evenly. If you were to remove one or two accesses, you would find the volume on the remaining streets would be exponentially increased. And that's where you find people start doing cut throughs to try to get away from that type of congestion. Um, there was a much earlier version of this plan. And if you can see where my mouse is pointing, where it was a straight from concession all the way down to Weston with pretty much no breaks. And our concern with that um, initial plan was that that was gonna become a complete speedway and people were gonna use it as a shortcut and everyone would cut down to the South to come out to Weston. So we've really tried to break up the road network so that if you're in the North end of the subdivision, it really doesn't make sense to come down to Weston Drive because it's not a direct traffic route. You really have to kind of circumvent. Uh, and I wanted to also mention, I know there's a lot of concern about unit numbers and density and the fact that there is such a wide range in unit numbers. The main reason for that range is in these uh, high density and medium density blocks, because the official plan sets out a minimum density and a maximum. And we've really just applied those official plan minimums and maximums. And depending on how those blocks develop, it could be a huge range. If someone wants to do, say, a block of townhouses, that's going to have significantly less units than if someone divide, develops this with apartment buildings and has underground parking. So we've done some math and numbers and uh, what I can confirm is about 70% of the density in the subdivision is north of Esseltine Drive. So um, I heard the comment about how much of the public comments get considered. Um, we, and when I say we, MHBC, when we, we do a lot of subdivision planning and one of the things we always look at before we even submit an application is, what's in the surrounding area, what are the surrounding uses? And it was pretty clear to us right away that with this being a low density neighborhood, we wanted to make sure we were weighting our density more to the north so that the density decreases as you get south and that you're not directing the majority of traffic down to the south. Um, similarly, um, with the existing single detached that we're going to be backing onto, we wanted to ensure that we're proposing single detached along the same route, which is the intent. Um, we've, as Eric mentioned, we've increased the minimum lot size along this block. So the zoning would normally allow a minimum of 10.5 meters. 
we've um, proposed 12.2 as the minimum lot frontage. And then we looked at the um, site specific zoning of what's beside us. And there are a number of things in it that we thought would probably not be um, wanting to carry forward by the residents. And that's decreased rear yard setbacks and decreased lot depth. So we have not carried those um, reduced lot depths and lot um, rear yard setbacks into our proposal. We have to meet the minimum lot depth and the minimum rear yard setback. So those are some of the things that um, when we were laying out the subdivision, we we really did with the mindset of, we want to ensure that you know traffic is really going to concession, quarter line and out to Baldwin Street and really trying to avoid traffic movements on those local streets. And our, our traffic engineer is on the virtual call. So if there's really detailed traffic questions, I would ask that you ask them because um, I'm not a traffic engineer. Um, and then just to mention that um, this subdivision will be built in phases with a number of different registrations. So we anticipate that conservatively, it's probably 10 to 15 years at least before this entire thing would ever be built out. Um, and the intent is that we would register from the north end south. So the um, this area at the south can't go in until the sw swim block is um, provided. And it just makes sense from a staging perspective that we start at the north end. So I did want to just assure everyone here today that this isn't this approval doesn't mean all of this is built in one registration. The um, the town and the county doesn't allow that to happen, even if we wanted it to. It will be a series of um, registrations before it's all built out. And I've already talked about this, this is just talking about um, how we're planning singles besides singles, how we've increased the minimum lot frontage, and we've proposed to keep the lot depths and rear yard setbacks um, as the parent bylaw would require. And this is the uh, subdivision that's before you this evening. And I just wanted to point out two couple of the changes from what was initially submitted. So. I mentioned earlier that there was um, originally two smaller parks proposed, one sort of at the north end, one at the south end, and we were proposing a, a part land, part cash and loo. Through comments received through circulation, we've now centralized and done one large park, and the park land size has increased from about 1.3 hectares to 2.073 hectares. So we've got greater amounts of park land in this version. The open space block at the south has also uh, been enlarged to include the entire ravine feature and to include additional areas for compensation planning. So that open space block at the south increased from about 1.4 hectares to 1.776. Uh, and as I previously mentioned, we've now applied split zoning along the lots that back onto the hedgerow so that it makes it easier to retain that feature. Uh, the number of driveways, our earlier version, we had lots on both sides of Esseltine, so there would have been a significantly num bigger number of driveways. We've reduced the number of driveways um, by putting the park along Esseltine and um, the medium density block, which would likely only have one entrance. Uh, and then a number of walkway blocks connecting this park down to the south uh, will be required, and that will be dealt with through detailed design. And where requested by engineering staff, the road right of ways have been increased, and that's predominantly at Grandview, the street in from concession. Um, the portion that goes out uh, from Weston and uh, Durham Drive, I think, was already at that uh, road width. So that is um, my presentation. I'm happy to respond to any questions. Again, um, the project engineers are also here. So if there's servicing related questions, I'll maybe have them come up. Uh, but otherwise, happy to respond to any questions council may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions from council? Seeing <laughs> Councillor Parker, then Councillor Spencer. Through you, Mayor Galvezi. Um, first off, thanks for your presentation tonight. Um, the first question that I have is: You said that public consultation has been part of uh, part of building this uh, this development. Um, did you guys have the opportunity to meet with the Baldwin Place residents? And if so, um, were there any um, any ideas brought forward from them that you've incorporated into this uh, this development? So we haven't uh, had a meeting. This has been the first public meeting that's been scheduled. 
Um, as I mentioned, there's a number of things that we looked at even before submitting, such as making sure we're having a consistent zone, um, having larger frontages. But some of the things included, um, like I said, on Esseltine Road, we used to have a previous design where there was going to be a lot more um, traffic coming out. I believe we actually had Esseltine extending right to the Western property. So we tried to make that a, have more of a local street function. Um, having, again, keeping the density sort of north of Esseltine Road uh, and making sure that we're not doing things like reducing setbacks against uh, existing developments. So uh, in terms of some of the specific things that we've heard through Baldwin Place, such as removing the road connections from you know, a traffic perspective, a safety and an emergency services perspective, um, it was the advice of um, the county, the town planning, and also our, our uh, traffic consultants that that would have a negative impact if we were to remove those road connections. So it is something we've looked at and talked about after seeing those um, comments. And the um, the response was that it was going to be creating a larger issue if we did, didn't have those road connections. And it's also, um, they're designated right in the county's official plan and were always intended to be extended along with their services. Okay, follow up. Um, so essentially um, this the neighborhood that you're impacting my personal opinion is that when you're developing a neighborhood you shouldn't have a major impact on existing neighborhoods you should take into consideration what the people that have already been there and live in um, how you're going to affect them this this development has a large impact on residents that already live there um, to me, there should have been public consultation between you and the residents association that has put a ton of work into coming up with ideas to alleviate some of their concerns so that it has minimal impact on their development. And to me, that wasn't done. And part of being a good neighbor is communicating. And with, de with developing behind... With developing right behind them, that should have been where the starting point was. What can we do to minimize the impact on your community that you've already lived here or that we've already lived here? And that's one of the, the major things that I have. So I, I understand that you guys have been doing everything from the planning perspective, but at the same time, there's people's lives that are directly impacted by doing this. So um, I, I, did, I will go back to one other question that I have. Um, and that's in regards to Grandview Drive. Um, I didn't, I didn't, I may have missed it on the map. Is Grandview Drive in your plan to be extended out to connect with, say, Street, I believe it's Street F? Is that in the plan? It's, uh, I'll just go back to the plan. So this is the Grandview Drive extension. So it connects to Street A, A. from Concession, and then it um, it does connect to Street F as well. Okay. Um, and just to follow up in regards to Street F, I know that you said in an original plan, you had it as a straight through road and it was changed um, by suggestion. Um, what is the benefit to the development of having Street F meander the way that it does versus being straight and adding in stop signs per se? Um, because I would think for emergency services and moving through that having a straight road is a lot easier to, to navigate than driving a fire truck uh, down a winding road. Well, it comes down to, um... A number of things in terms of emergency act service access there's multiple road points that access can be granted um, having this as a straight through even for residents within this future development it's having that become sort of a speedway and we've all been in those neighborhoods that have those one long straight road and everyone just speeds through them no matter what kind of traffic coming you put in so it was really intended to kind of slow things down and also as i mentioned previously with having the density weighted to the north. Our concern was if there was just this straight connection, then people at the north would use that to avoid going out to quarter line and, and some of the other existing roads. So um, we were trying to actually uh, make it for a slowed down sort of version of traffic as opposed to having easy shortcut routes. Just one follow up to that. Um, 
by doing that or by not doing that on street F, but essentially you're extending Esseltine and you're extending Weston, are you not creating that same situation in the existing neighborhood by doing that? Thank you. Next slide, please. Just let, just let the planner answer. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned before, because of all these accesses, traffic gets dispersed. So if you're at this south end where it's the lower density, absolutely those residents are going to likely come out to Weston Drive. If this was a straight shot here, then I think there's a great opportunity that a significantly higher number of people are going to cut down to this street. Same with Esseltine. If this was straight through um, with lots of lots here, but Durham Drive is going to be the easier connection to get over to Quarter Town, uh, Quarter Line, especially because of all the driveways in Baldwin Place. That automatically makes this sort of the less direct route. Uh, again, our traffic consultants are on and might be able to better respond to these, but um, there is, in our, uh, when we looked at this previously, there were bigger traffic concerns when we had that full north south connection. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, just to piggyback before I go to Councillor Spencer, just to piggyback on that. Um, so there's another development in town and I get multiple traffic complaints and I go there often and we have we have um, a camera on that um, particular road and it often shows that people aren't speeding. And this is the interesting thing. The average speed was actually 37K. The problem is the volume and it's the volume. And we're experiencing that everywhere in town with the amount of growth that we had. I mean, I think we've got close to 2,000 housing units here before this council this evening. Um, and the problem becomes, it's not necessarily that they're speeding. Yes, people standing on their porch may think that people are speeding, but actually our speed cameras show that they're not. But it is the sheer volume. Um, traffic reports are great, but they also may make assumptions. Right there is they're they're making predictions as to what the potential homeowner is going to do, right? They're not it's not black and white, yeah. right? Because if I lived you know in that area and, and I was heading to Zares, which is the other end of town, and would probably go through Baldwin Place because that's the shortest route. People are all about the shortest route, not necessarily the smartest route or the safest route, the shortest route, because we live in a society where people are in a hurry. So, Councillor Spencer. Thank you through the mayor uh, to to yourself. Um, when looking at the map, like you can see the houses and whatnot, and it looks like five houses down Durham will be extended out uh, to this community. Um, and so it would make sense that like if it's just five houses down that Esseltine wouldn't be used given the amount of, um, you know, lack of wanting it from that community so i'm just curious why uh it was felt that both both of those were re wanted or required um well in part there's services in both that need to be extended so there was always when this was designed it was designed with the intent and that's why there was a road stub left there was because it was designed to extend and to have the services extend so um you know uh, again, we talked about this with um, county staff in terms of what it would look like to remove those accesses, and the concern was that it's going to cause increases in volume everywhere else, and it could create bigger issues as a result. Um, having multiple accesses really does help disperse that traffic more evenly so that you're not having it all hung out on one or two spots. Same with Durham Drive. The services are right there to the end. It was always intended that that road would uh, extend. That's why it's shown in your official plan. Uh, if I can continue. Um, so, but given like the safety, like you're talking about extra volume, but given the safety of this community, being an adult community, um, as well as um, the concerns from the community, um, I just question why that would be felt necessarily, but I'll, I'll let that go. My other question is, in regards to um, the green space of uh, land use, um, you've mentioned a few, and I, I can't seem to find it in our oodles of pages. What is planned for across, uh, like between the two communities, between the existing Baldwin and the new uh, Victoria? So are you talking along here? Yes. So these uh, units all back on right now, so it's a rear the rear lots are abutting to our neighborhood. So 
this is intended to be single detached. So we're not proposing any uh, townhomes. It would be single detached. And they would likewise um, back on with, so it'd be a rear yard to rear yard condition. And uh, as I mentioned, the zoning of these lots adjacent to us have lesser um, rear yard setbacks and shallower lot depths permitted. We have not proposed to carry that forward. So there would still be the regular rear yard setback. So um, nothing within at least 7.5 meters and the same typical minimum lot depth of 30 meters that the zoning would uh, permit. So it's the same R2 zone, but we haven't carried forward um, some of the other specifics that we've seen elsewhere, which would allow for tighter, shallower lots up against those, but it would be single detached. And if I could, any existing trees there? What, what's the plan? Um, I don't believe there's, there's not a mature hedgerow like you see elsewhere, but we do have to do um, as part of the uh, back plan conditions, there's a full on tree management, tree preservation plan required. So once we get into that detailed design, we'll be looking at um, anywhere if there's uh, trees that are along this that where we can try to preserve them. Nothing further, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, maybe just to follow through with that, is there a um, fence planned, like a wood fence? I'm not talking chain link fence, I'm talking wood fence. Is there a, a plan for a cohesive, like looks the same all across wood fence? Uh, it's a good con question. I'm not sure if it's typically required. I know we usually have to have um, chain link where you're adjacent to say natural features, but it's uh, something we can take back and, and talk to planning staff about as a, as a possible. Um, I don't believe typically you do um, fence between residential to residential, but it is something we can look at. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Luciani. Through Mayor. Uh, um, just uh, just in, ter in terms of the, uh, the entire development here, I mean, Obviously, uh, we're trying to do everything we can to uh, to mitigate any of the concerns that, that it's going to have on Baldwin Place. I mean, we, we realize that Baldwin Place, as it exists and how, as it's been there, has been a great draw to the town, has brought great people to town. And obviously, we want to do whatever we can within reason to make, uh, you know, whatever we can do to mitigate, to keep everybody happy. My question is um, a couple. Um, one, the medium density 45 to 88 units between Durham and Esseltine. Is that intended to, uh, you, you indicate there's likely to be one entrance in and out. Is that in, intended to uh, disperse out, out, out onto Esseltine or onto Del, uh, Durham? Um, so as uh, Eric mentioned, this would have to go through a future site plan phase. I would anticipate that there may be an entrance on each. However, we've done um, multiple blocks like this before where the second entrance is more of a emergency only, so it can be kind of chained off unless it's needed. And that's certainly something through site plan we could look at so that you really only have the Durham Drive access. I just think for emergency services or fire, you might have to have a, a second, but we have done them before where it's sort of only used in emergency purposes. And that might be one good solution to kind of, again, then we're down to sort of single detached and just the park frontage and, and a really minimal number of driveways on Esseltine. Um, if I may, may continue, the um, I, I realized the initial plan had a straight a straight road leading right on through and connecting to West End. And I do like the way that it's broken up, and 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 I do agree with you. I think it will disperse traffic a lot better uh, this way, and you're definitely not going to have that cut through. That's providing that there is an access on on West End. So my next question is, if that access isn't there, how does it affect the subdivision, and how does it affect servicing going forward? And conversely, uh, with Esseltine Drive, same uh, same question. So in terms of Weston, I'll, I'll probably maybe have Andrew speak to the servicing part of it. But um, our biggest concern with, uh, besides the fact that there was um, the intent, is that services still need to come through here. But if this Weston is eliminated, then for emergency response, you've got all of this uh, development on the south end and a really long distance to go before you get to an access road. So from an emergency services perspective, um, I think there would be a significant concern there. Uh, and then in terms of Esseltine, similarly, the road's been designed to go through, the services are there. So regardless, the services have to come through. Uh, and it just, you know, it, it doesn't really make sense to just have this broad servicing corridor when it was always intended. but. Um, what was the official plan would have done is had Esseltine come all the way to the western boundary. So if lands further to the west ever come in, 
they would all use that. And we did eliminate that road stub because we really felt Durham Drive made more sense to be if those lands ever come in in the future we didn't want to have all that additional land coming to Esseltine so we have tried to notwithstanding the designation of it as a collector treat it more like a local road and, and that's really been informed in large part by how it developed in Baldwin Place with a bunch of single detached and individual driveways coming out. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rosart. Thank you, Madam Mayor, through you to the speaker. So you're starting on the north side to build, is what you're is that what you're telling us? So it'll have to be registered in a multitude of phases. And the intent is that we would start registration to the north and this with the south being sort of the last phases phases to register. And what year do you think you'll get to the south end? Uh, well, I gave an estimate of, I think, if we're being aggressive, it might be 10 years. I, I think realistically, it's probably more to 10 to 15 before you would ever see this fully get built out. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Any other questions from council? So point of order, please. We're still in a planning meeting. Thank you. Um, Councilor Luciani. If I may, just one uh, one additional question. Has there been any consideration given to, uh, I, from emergency uh, services uh, side of it, I mean, I would hate to see one street trapping people into uh, a subdivision and the way it's sitting. So I'm personally, and I and I may not be a popular decision or a popular point tonight, I do think that the connection on the south end needs to be there. but. At the other point, we talk about traffic mitigation. We talk about if we put a straight street in and doing traffic mitigation. Have you thought about traffic mitigation if it was to be connected down there, number one? And number two, is there a way possibly that it could even be a, a one-way in type thing or um, even bollards or something that are, are able to be uh, up and down? Or I'm just throwing different, uh, different ideas out. Thank you. Um, it hasn't been. I mean, Part of why we do traffic studies is for them to identify sort of where there may be issues. And if there's intended, um, the thought is there's major issues, then they recommend different type of traffic calming measures. Typically something like this, um, you, you as, as it was mentioned tonight, traffic engineers make their best case suggestions are usually conservative in terms of they plan for the worst case scenario. But in terms of if traffic calming is needed, it's usually more determined after full built out once things are happening. Um, I don't know that, um, you know, engineering staff would support sort of a, a write-in or a one-way only. Um, it just, you know, our, our the response to the application was we needed to make that connection wider. So, um, and we had originally didn't have this connection and it was, you need to bring it all the way to the West End. So um, there is conflicting and we, we understand the concerns of, of the neighborhood, but we've also got... Um, sort of the desire of, of public works and engineering of saying we need to have these road connections and, and the traffic engineer saying the same thing. So um, it is a challenge. Um, and I, we've tried to minimize, as I said, by not having Esseltine go right to the road. I think um, there's some things we can do with that multiple block that would help. And, um, and again, by just weighting the density the way we have, we've really tried to make it so that the majority of traffic is going to be going sort of concession and quarter line. Anyone else? This is the final call for questions. Go ahead. Um, just in regards to Councillor Luciani's question, um, when we're looking at that south end, there's no way to create a, a exit out to Lowry without being in this community, or not, yeah, Lowry, without it being in this community. Um, You'll have to remind me where Lowry is. Is that further it, down this way? Am I right with that? Yeah, yeah. It's Pressy, and then it turns into Lowry, which is outside of this community out to there. So is it down here somewhere? In the south end, yeah. So we We've got the significant natural feature here. So putting a road through that open space block would be, I would say, not supported by um, conservation authority or um, staff because there is significant uh, natural feature there. Okay. And then my second. And then further road connection here, uh, if that was to ever extend west and that's outside of our, our control, I don't know if there are future plans for that road 
to extend. Certainly if it did, um, that would provide another way out, but that's again, outside of the, the limits of the draft plan. So we don't have any control over external road extensions. Okay. Um, and in regards to if there wasn't an exit at that end, um, has there been a study done to know like what the time we're talking about? Like if let's say emergency vehicles needed to come up Durham to get to that section, uh, what the difference of time that would be? Uh, no, we haven't done. Um, all I can say is we didn't receive any comments from emergency services through the formal um, application process, but we haven't looked at what the difference would be. We did when we um, saw the comments came through, ask our traffic consultants to look at and consider and and what they said uh, what they said is consistent with what I'm saying is that removing that would mean that other traffic elsewhere would increase significantly and um, for example if you removed this but kept Esseltine then more people are going to take this and potentially cut through the subdivision so thank you thank you very much thank you uh, next, there is an opportunity for anyone in attendance to speak in opposition to the application. So I would invite you to um, come to the podium. You have to uh, sign, this, sign the paper and uh, state your name. So if there's more than one of you, I would suggest lining up over on the side by Amelia's desk there. Or we see Laurel with her. Thank you, Laurel. So you might just press the enter when you want to go to the next one. Okay. Yeah. Sir, uh, would you like to speak? You can just stay there and we'll get you in the queue if it's more comfortable. Because there's not, you're okay, it's up to you. I just want to make sure that there's enough room there. Okay, are we above capacity at this? Absolutely. So just to re a reminder that um, everyone please remain quiet so that the um, anyone opposing this has obviously um do recourse to bring their concerns forward so welcome mayor garbosi so tilsonburg council on our guests thank you for this opportunity to bring our concerns to you regarding the proposed development adjacent to our community we are mike wild president of Belgium place residents association board of directors and vice chair of the Belgium place tilsonburg west committee Commissioner Bell Place consists of 282 homes. These are the, the uh, bring up the screen now, the members of our board of directors and the committee involved in putting this presentation together. I am joined tonight by over 95 residents of our community and a petition signed over 270 residents to support our position. We have provided the clerk with packages in order to provide you with more detail regarding our concerns and the impact the Victoria Road development will have on our community if it is allowed to proceed as currently proposed by the developer. Let me assure you, we are not against development as such. Our purpose is to maintain the safety, security, and integrity of Baldwin Place and residents. 
I would like to draw your attention to some of our key concerns. Victoria Road's own traffic forecast estimates over 2,300 additional vehicles daily will travel through our community with 500 residents. This is contrary to Oxford County's official plan, Section 8.2. Housing development in residential areas states traffic pattern from development is to be designed to create minimal impact on local streets. There was a traffic impact study done February 9th, 2023, and that stated, and I'll quote, based on this review, we confirm that the findings and conclusions of the April 2022 traffic impact study are valid for the updated draft plan. Victoria Woods traffic forecast estimates slightly more daily vehicle traffic through our community than is forecast to travel along Concession Street and Major County Road. We would ask that the roadway at the southern end of the development, Western Drive, be situated so there is no access into Baldwin Place. We would ask Russell Drive to remain closed under the proposed Victoria Road plan. There will be six arterial roads connecting to Quarter Town Line in a space of 465 meters. At present, the east end of Esseltine is used by parents to park while dropping off and picking up their children from the nearby West, Westfield Public School. The current proposed plan will turn Esseltine into half a kilometer of one of the few straight roads in Tilsonburg, a potential raceway adjacent to a proposed park, our senior citizens, community, and children's pickup area. Although we are aware the roads throughout Baldwin Place are designed to accept higher traffic volumes, our community is not. We ask Council to approve the establishment of a green belt. Oops. Sorry, that along the western boundary of Baldwin Place from Essentine to June Ferry. This would also stop removal of existing tree line. We would ask Council to ensure the design of the drainage system within the development does not flow into Baldwin Place's existing soils. We would ask Council's assurance that Victoria Woods plans comply with Oxford County's plan regarding those lots adjacent to our community. Victoria Wood has requested R2-35 zoning in those blocks backing onto Baldwin Place. The zoning permits detached dwellings, semi-detached, and duplexes. The Oxford County official plan 8.3 housing development in residential areas require new residential lots with direct exposure to established residential street to be consistent with the established pattern. This would require lots to maintain setbacks and spacing between buildings to be consistent with the established build pattern. We ask that all new housing backing onto Baldwin Place meet standards of existing Baldwin Place properties, single detached dwellings, R2-5, R2-5H, single story, maximum height of 7.6 meters. The current high density housing proposed will have a detrimental impact on the community's identity, safety, and security. The added strain on our community services, medical, fire, and policing is obvious. Many of our new residents are having difficulty going with family doctor. To ensure minimal disruption to our community from noise, dust, and dirt, we require assurance from the developer that during construction, temporary access for construction vehicles will not be permitted on any street within Baldwin Place. We would ask that the placement of site storage, staging areas, and temporary facilities be located 
on the west side of the development and or north of Esseltine Drive. Here in Councillors, the More Homes Build Faster Act of 2022 has silenced our voice as a concerned community group. We now turn to you, our elected council, to speak on our behalf. We must rely on you to ensure the safety, security, and integrity of Baldwin Place is maintained. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions from council to the presenter? Councillor Parsons and then Councillor um, Park. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Wild, for your presentation. Uh, your last slide uh, hits us on the head. The more homes built for faster act is going to handcuff this municipality, the County of Oxford. You referenced the uh, county planning. Uh, things are changing. They're going to change a lot more, I think, before these homes are built. And it's going to make it uh, very difficult for a municipality to put uh, plans in place um, to limit the growth. In a few minutes, I'm sure you're going to hear from a number of members of council, myself included, that are going to pose many elements of this of this report. I don't know how well that will go because the planner, the developer rather, can just basically take this and do what they want. So I appreciate your, your presentation. It was excellent. I, I feel um, compassionate uh, to the residents of Baldwin Place. But things are changing under the homes built for, for uh, uh, the more homes built fast track. So I think we do have to look at uh, traffic and safety and things of that matter. And that's where I'll be speaking to in a few minutes. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Parker. Through you, Mayor Gelvezi, to uh, Mr. Wild. First off, thank you for your presentation and the time and effort that you and your residents association have put into uh, putting together um, ideas and concern, your concerns. Uh, the one question I did have was in regards to emergency services and your request for um, the closure of Esseltine and Weston. Um, do you guys, in your research, did you guys come forward with any ideas that would help to mitigate the concerns that uh, may be brought forward with slower response times due to limited entrances into that uh, neighborhood? Fortunately, Councillor Parker, we're not traffic engineers, so we're kind of amateurs trying to do as much a professional job as we can. The emergency services come in from the north. And the fire department is at uh, at Concession and, and Tilson. Uh, the hospital is at Ralph and, and concession. So I would think if there was anything coming in from there, it would be faster to come in from the north than to go down to the south and come in through through our community. Um, apart from that, I don't have a response, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Um, thank you very much. Um, number one, um, I read, you know, I read through your proposal and have received many emails from your community. Uh, number one, I think it's great that people are engaged. Um, Councillor Parsons did speak to something. Um, we are mandated by the province to get shovels on the ground. And, and that is the reality that we face, but that does not mean that we can't look at factors like, um, you know, safety and, and disruptions to neighboring community or neighboring communities but um i would encourage the enthusiasm that you shared with this council to share with your upper tiers of government because the more homes built faster act this is just the beginning of it thank you next <laughs> Welcome. Then, what's your name? Bear with me. I'm not a professional speaker, so I am Michael Zavaris, 29 Hogarth Drive, Baldwin Place. And I'm addressing this to Mayor Gervaisen, Town Council, and guests. I have a mobility problem. 
I'm 88 years old, fighting to stay home out of long-term care. In my area of Baldwin Place, I am not the minority. I am the majority. That is why I chose Baldwin Place. Birds of a feather flock together. I don't use our phone communication. I rely on old-fashioned mail method. To get the mailbox close to my home, I must cross two streets or walk on the street. Walking on the street is the shortest distance. Walking on the street is the method I use. Allowing increased traffic of any kind in Baldwin Place community would cause a safety hazard for myself. I can't speak for other residents. Using Baldwin Place streets to access a new development is a want, not a need. It seems young people are always in a hurry. Please do not use Baldwin Place streets to save a few minutes' time for others. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Does uh, any do any council members have any questions? No, seeing none. We're next in line. We can step up to the podium. Thank you very much. Oh boy, gentlemen, you got like that. Your Worship, Mayor Galvesi, members of the council, thank you for the opportunity to share my concerns about the proposed development adjacent to our community at Baldwin Place. My name is Maureen Flynn. I live at 100 Western Drive in Tilson Burke. I am very concerned about the traffic that this development has been proposed will have on our community. And I'm also very concerned about the quality of life that will be forever changed with this proposal. I would like first to address the traffic. This proposal takes a dead end street and a cul-de-sac and makes a major town road with a minimum of 1,550 cars per day. It will change Western Drive from the quiet extension of Veterans Memorial Walkway. It does go to the very end of Western Drive and into the creek. To a high traffic roadway. It will, when we bought our property, we knew and we expected that there would be development in the corn and bean field across from our home. We did not, however, expect that our street would host the traffic from that development. In its revised proposal, the developer has actually increased nine units in the number of homes to be developed and decreased the traffic now. Everybody here at Baldwin Place knows I'm really bad at math. <laughs> but I know if you increase the number of units, you're not going to decrease the traffic. It just doesn't make sense. Here are the numbers of vehicles the developer had given us in the first proposal with fewer homes. Through Baldwin Place, there would be 2,000 330 vehicles per day. Breaking down that further, 800, sorry, 780 cars a day would travel on Essel time. That leaves a whopping 1,550 cars on that little stretch of Western Road in Baldwin Street. Let me paint the picture for you. Today, there are eight houses on that little stretch of Western Drive. And there are seven houses on Gene Ferry. That means there are about 20 cars that use that road today, morning, friends, visitors, and whatever. 
That's a long time. I thought that was in 550. Now let's add to that the 31 Jews on Ferris Crescent that have to enter onto Baldwin Place. And the 28 homes that are already in Baldwin Place that use that stretch to get to Forty Two and downtown and wherever they're going. The impact is far greater than the Oxford Plan and Traffic in Section 8.2 that says traffic impacts should create minimal disturbance to local streets. Like, really? There is no current road connecting the proposed new development to Baldwin Place on Western Drive right now. It's a road. It has sidewalks on both sides. There is no opening. It is just a road. And in, for many of us, it's just an extension of our Veterans Memorial Parkway. We have a lifestyle community. This amount of traffic can't help but negatively affect our lifestyle. I can hardly imagine getting out of Baldwin Place in an early morning appointment, appointment with 1,500 cars or 750 cars ahead of me waiting to turn while they get to work. Now, I come to you with alternatives. I'm not coming to complain. I have solutions. I do believe there are very valid concerns about accessing emergency vehicles to our development at the south end. And I believe that an emergency access, similar to the one that connects Border Town Line to Coleman Avenue, which is a kind of a one vehicle, one way road that the emergency people use, would not impact our community, but would also provide that access. I also suggest that if you extend road F to Lowry Line, which runs parallel to the south end of this development, there's a little farmer's field and then Lowry Line. Lowry Line is a country road. It already is ready for traffic. That that could eliminate the traffic issue at the south end of Baldwin. So I come to you with a concern and I come to you with a suggestion. The second issue I am concerned with in the development plan as it's revised is the lack of green space. One big park is a great idea. If you have all those people accessing the little parkettes at Baldwin Place at the corner of Western Drive and Baldwin isn't really going to be the answer. That's the place where people who walk from town to the end of the walkway, the Memorial Veterans Memorial Parkway, stop at the bench, visit, have a little rest, and carry on. It's not really a park. It's a parkette. And further to that, Baldwin Place maintains that. The town releases it to us, and we maintain it. So I hardly can think that the town's going to sell that to a developer to call it their green space when it isn't even in the development. Like, that's kind of crazy to me. The end of the, the, the Veterans Memorial Park, Park, as I said, is the southern end of the trail is at the end of Western Drive. And there's a wee little woodland walkway. If you've ever walked it, particularly in the fall, it's actually quite magical. There's a ravine and a little creek. and I know this won't happen when the development happens, but right now I see deer along that little parkway. And I know that the woodland animals are there. I can't help but think that will be impacted on this trail, on this development. People, not only from Baldwin Place and Hickory Hills, but all through town walk that Veterans Memorial Parkway. And I have to tell you, they don't want to have a They probably should. But they walk down the little quiet western road and venture into the forest area. And I believe the new neighbors that we will be having will enjoy that walk too. And I believe they will walk into town the way we walk into town. And that will be 
part of what our own Tilsonburg Trails Minister Plan promoted when it talked about building better health, stronger communities, and protecting natural areas. A road that accommodates 15 cars a day <laughs> protect the woodlands at the end of that parkway, and it will certainly not build a greener community. The families of the new development will need parks and swing sets and places for picnics, and we know that it's the job of the developer to put those in. We need our green spaces, and you know what? COVID taught us that. The green belt we need in Baldwin Place could be a green belt extending from Esseltine to Gene Ferry. It would define our community within Tilsonburg and at the Western Road and define the boundary of the Veterans Memorial Parkway. It would also be in keeping with the Tilsonburg Trails Master Plan, which advocates whenever possible there be at least a one meter vegetation buffer for snow removal along its trail. I am worried that the town of Tilsonburg might not have enough sports fields, arena space, public parks, pools, parks to support all its development. I'm worried that there are, are not schools, public and Catholic, for children to walk to. And I'm worried that in five years, people will ask who in town council permitted 1,500 cars on a residential street. Graphic, lifestyle. I worry about that. And you do too. Thank you. Is there any questions or comments from council? Sorry, stepping back. Seeing, seeing none, thank you very much for your presentation. Is there anyone else? There's still line up down the hallway. Hey, Madam Mayor. Okay. Members of council, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Um, before, is, she, is, sorry, just state your name. I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, Uva Clutchman, I live at 38 Esseltine Drive in Tilsonburg. And I was wondering if we can put the uh, development map up again. Is that possible? Well, it's, it's not overly critical i thought it's just i'm i'm not a techie i thought you just flick a switch and you go from this to yeah. obviously not um with respect to esseltine the developer suggested there was an internal road that ran from one end to the other and he said well she said well that was uh conducive to a racetrack kind of environment now if you look at esseltine it is a straight road from quarter town line to almost three quarters through the development. And if you measure it, it probably almost measures the length of the road inside the development. Uh, just a point. Um, the other point I was going to make is when I listened to a planner about water and sewer, now, I wasn't quite sure what the answer was, and I'm not sure if the county is responsible for water supply and sewer, or if Tilsonburg is responsible for the water supply and distribution, and the county is responsible for the sewer. Water and sewer is the county. Is the county? Of well, the reason, um, okay, with respect to Bill 23, there is a section in the Planning Act which Bill 23 did not omit. And that section allows uh, town councils and councils and, uh, of course, uh, townships and regions to turn around development if the uh, services that are required cannot be provided, which includes incidentally schools. It's been a long standing issue, but I haven't seen a council yet turn it down because. It was in these schools. I'm disappointed with a school vote response, but hey, they can say whatever they want. Um, so we, I, I forgot, I should have looked it up, but I forgot what the section was. But in the actual planning act and, and section 20, uh, it doesn't eliminate that section from the planning act. 
In other words, if you or a township can't, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the county has a problem with water supply or sewer supply, um, then the county can turn the development down based until such time that the water supply and the sewer is actually up to snuff and can support the development. And as Madam Mayor pointed out, this isn't the only development. We have two other ones online. We're looking at two, 3,000 people. Um, the other part that was a little bit of a concern to me is we, I heard discussion about emergency services, et cetera, et cetera. The standard process, and I'm not sure how it works in Tilsonburg Council, but the standard process is if you get in a development application, the development application is uh, uh, circulated to the fire department, emergency services, ERS, uh, community services, engineering, and you know the whole gamut. And they will come back and look at it, and they will say, yes, it's okay, no, it's not okay. Uh, fire department will say, well, we're already having a problem with water pressure. Uh, adding another 50 fire hydrants to the system is likely not going to be appropriate. Yeah, I'm just saying, when you look at the entire development process or developments that are coming before council, the, the, the community service department should respond and say, well, in five, time, in five years, the ice time is no longer adequate. The indoor pool is not large enough. The outdoor pool uh, capacity will be exhausted. Park, the parks will no longer uh, be sufficient. Our recreational activities need to be bumped up. So we can give you a cost estimate. And you, the logical question would be, well, that's fine. You know, how much does that going to cost? If you add another 20 miles of road to the system, well, we need another snow plow. Um, once we pile up snow, where we're going to put it. I would like engineering so, or, or, or the uh, engineering department's assessment of how, when you look at the internal road network, where we're going to put the snow. If we get a major snowstorm, they will be pushing around in circles because there's nowhere to go. I went and dumped it into a uh, sponsor uh, uh, collection agency. Anyhow, overall, Yes, you know, we got a vote. <laughs> um, but Tilsonburg is the kind of town I figured out you can't get there from here. And what that means is anybody on the west side, there are two roads. That's, that's uh, Baldwin and that is Concession. There's nothing on this end. You're adding 2,000 people, roughly, to the take. There's no employment land. There's no employment. There's no work. Shopping, everything. Government services, grocery shopping, restaurants, fast food. Probably, of course, I don't care what services people need. It's over there. And there are two roads of this area here. That's concession and that's bulk. That development is actually technically and totally in the wrong place. Now you can fix that. It's beyond us to fix it, but you could fix it. If you meet the road at the very top end of the, uh, of the development and run it all the way to three, that means all the traffic can go that road, they can feed into concession on this side, feed into three on the other side. Three, you get to the employment lands that Tilsonburg has right now, and uh, the, uh, of course, Bolt went internally, the collector uh, road uh, quarter timeline will automatically disperse to, uh, to uh, Baldwin or to concession. Like you don't have to open up Esseltine to get there. But Esseltine is sort of an add on, if you ask me. But this was May. Long term planning, the way it was presented, it doesn't solve any problems that the town faces. None. Zero. It creates a massive traffic problem. You go down to uh, um, concession when that development is built, you may delay greens 
hitting Broadway. The same on the same on uh, Baldwin. Baldwin is basically a residential street. Never designed. Now we got the golf course development. You dump all that traffic onto Baldwin. Think about it. What's happening here? There's nothing here. So I would say run the road at the top end, run around three on one, run around concession on the other. Because not all the people are working in Tilsonburg. They work in they work in Woodstock. They might take County Road or they come down concession and then hook into uh, quarter town line out in room team. Or straight out concession to Woodstock. There it, what I'm saying is you're creating an internal problem in the town that this development will make. If that development would be over on the west side, you got lots of options. Lots of roads, lots of options. But being where it is, you're clogging it. Granted, we can't remove it, but you can make internal changes or external changes to the road network overall that will help not just Esseltine or or whatever, it'll help the overall traffic flow disperse it, right? Plus, in the end, they're going to add on anyway. That would be the next expansion for uh, for uh, employment lands, industrial, right? Because if you look at industrial one day, and they're running it, uh, they're running the streets up already. I mean, they, they try to appease us and say, well, we stop running this all the time as a dead end to to the north of the development. Well, nice. But you know what's going to come. And if you want industrial land because you're out of it, that's when you want it. And then you've got the road network. And if you share the cost between the developer, maybe a little bit by the town, maybe a little bit by the uh, county, then that takes a whole bunch of uh, traffic off the internal roads that exist in Tilsonburg already. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, just a point of clarification, the question was asked regarding taking the road out to Highway 3. It's a sensitive area that's being protected. Um, and so it, it doesn't appear that it's a good option, but thank you for bringing it forward. And furthermore, the town will be embarking on a very comprehensive master transportation master plan. Um, it was approved in the budget, so we will be looking at all roads, intersections, and things moving forward. Thank you. Does council have any questions? No, thank you very much. Thanks again, yeah. Hello, my name is Nancy Kretschmann. I also live on Esseltown Drive. And I have a couple of, of points of um, questions that I'd like to make. Firstly, uh, we were talking about Esseltown being a raceway. And I'm not sure that Andrea understands exactly what we mean by that. And since you can't get the map back up again, I wonder if I could just take a minute and show her what I mean by that. Andrea, would you mind? So what we're what we're okay. What we're excuse talking. me. Excuse me. We, you can't actually. We can't actually have the applicant back in. Oh, um, yeah. her, no, her presentation is okay. done. So you can't actually you can't ask what, questions? No. So you can ask questions of uh, Eric either? No. You can uh okay. present it to council. Sorry. All right. I'll do it that way. Um and maybe she can have a look on, on her own time at the way Essel time goes in a new turn and goes all the way around uh side of the school. If you go on to Essel time in the morning, you'll see 30 cars parked there dropping children off. School, but once this raceway goes through and this big new turn at the bottom of the park and back up, that's what parents are going to do. They're going to come in on Russell Train, look around the corner, drop them off at the school parking lot, and out they go. So those traffic studies that they're talking about are, are horrendous as it as it turns out. But they're going to be even more so every morning when children are being dropped off at school. And every evening when they're being picked up, because they're going to come in through there and they're going to circle around and they're going to drive out the other side. They've, they've created a, a real problem there. The other issue I'm concerned about is uh, the medium density that uh, is west of the school. And I understood Eric to say that that medium density would allow 
retail on the main floor. And if that's the case, I'm saying that we're going to have retail abutting uh, single family residential on Ethel Time. And that's a normal. And uh, when they talk about uh, medium density, they don't really tell us. I mean, she's saying it could be stacked townhouses, could be stacked townhouses with retail below, is my understanding. So I, I heard Eric say, uh, I could be wrong about that. I stand corrected if I am. And I still believe that the parkland should be flipped with medium density. So the parkland is abutting the schoolyard and the green and the tree belt and the medium density go in behind. And that way we wouldn't be impacted by stock townhouses possibly with retail. I can run our single family residential home there and on the sides. So that's all I have to say on the matter. And hopefully uh, you will take some of these concerns into consideration. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Eric. Did you want to say something? Yeah, the commercial block or the commercial uses would only happen in the medium density block next to Concession Street West because uh, right. there's direct access well, to Concession Street that. West and Arterial Road. Uh, it wouldn't be on the uh, park block or the medium density block adjacent to the park or the school. Thank you, Eric, for the clarification. Welcome. Hi, Council. Thanks very much for giving me a chance to talk to you. Yeah, we having fun yet? Um, I'm not going to rehash all the things that have been said about streets and Esseltine and there. Sorry, could you please give us your name? Oh, my apologies. My name is Kim Yo, and I live on Fairs. Testing, testing. Okay, super. So um, I don't want to rehash all of the, the stuff that people have already brought up tonight. There, there obviously are some really serious concerns that the residents have. Um, I do have to, you know, sort of commend the, the developer in making some changes. However, we need more changes made. And all I'm really wanting to ask you guys right now is... And we know that Building More Homes Act is going to override or potentially can override anything that's decided here tonight. But I am asking that you guys not endorse this as it is currently presented. Building is going to happen. We know that. But I think there's a lot of room for improvement. There's consultation that can happen between the developer and Baldwin Place. So all I'm here to ask is, that we not approve this presentation as it has been presented tonight. Doesn't mean it's not gonna be built in the future. It's not about not in my backyard. It's let's just take a little bit of time, get the, the interested parties together and come up with a better plan. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Welcome. Mayor Govese, uh Town Council. My name is uh, Stephen Delella, and uh, I live at 147 and also represent 151 Concession Street West. Uh, on the plan, it was indicated as the tree farm. Um, we've heard a lot of great uh, uh, concerns here tonight. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't smart enough to think of them. When I wrote this letter to Eric back on October the 3rd, I'm not sure if uh, he forwarded the letter to you or not, but if not, I'm going to read it for everybody else here. My concerns mainly were for our property, um, which is going to have approximately four or 500 meters of fencing and trees uh, that currently exist around it that we're very concerned about. So I'll just read the letter. Um, and this was this was addressed to Eric, who I did talk to. As per our telephone conversation on September 19th, I'm addressing and writing some of my concerns regarding the application of the, for development of part of lots A and 9, concession 11, part of lot 8, concessions 12, Durham in the town of Tilsonburg. My wife and I, Sybil, Delella represent Regine and Doug Ross of 151 Concession Street West. 
In our discussion, I identified three issues of concern as it relates to the proximity of this development in the relation to the west and south property boundaries of the Ross property. Along these two property lines are a row of mature trees, some of which are just inside the property line, some falling in the middle of the property line, and some just outside the property line. It is obviously our desire to maintain all these trees. However, I do realize that this may not be possible. We would like to request a discussion with the owner of Victoria Wood GP Incorporated and ourselves to be arranged prior to the commencement of development in the proximity of these two property lines. We would expect and insist that any tree that lies fully on the Ross property remains standing with the exception for allowances of branches that may overhang the lands to be developed as per county guidelines. A discussion and plan of the remaining trees is requested. My second topic was of the type of fencing to be erected along these property lines. I fully understand that the type of fencing is reflective of the location of the remaining trees which line the property. We would also like a discussion regarding this item as well. Lastly, I would like to provide some input in regards to dedicated parkland allotted. I know that's already been brought up tonight, so we're all on the same page here. I do understand from our discussion that a revision of the parkland will be presented in a new plan draft later this fall, which is now out. Eric, I believe that you mentioned 5% must be reserved. I was expecting more. I'm disappointed in the fact that parks and green space is rapidly disappearing in the town of Tilsonburg. I have lived here for over 30 years. Our residential area and population have increased substantially and green space in, re in relation has declined. Although I am receptive to new residential developments, I am saddened to see trees and green space disappear. I am sure that you and town council are well aware of what I am get presenting. We, my wife and I have created our own green space of approximately two and a half hectares through a Trees Ontario grant. We maintain this ongoing and wish to preserve it for future generations. Preservation of green space is of great importance to us and should be for the entire Tilsonburg community. Please pass this letter on to the owners of Victoria Wood and anyone involved in the development process. So all I would ask at this point is I wanna be assured that the developer comes and talks to me personally regarding the trees on the property and the fencing that's gonna go up around it. Um, it's very important to us. I have spent the last 15 years grooming those trees in that property. I have not paid much attention to the property line itself, at this point, but inside that property line, uh, we call it the Arboretum, and uh, it probably takes me anywhere from two to three months every fall to maintain that, and I just don't want to see that disappear, and that is probably one of my main concerns about what's happening in Tilsonburg is the lack of green space and trees that we have. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Council. My name is Hannibal Mutar. We live on 23 Jones Crescent. We just recently moved into town and we love it. So uh, we've been quite impressed. I haven't prepared any statement, but actually the reason why I'm here is because I'm concerned about what I've heard. Give me a background, not tooting my horn. I have my PhD in agricultural engineering. There's lots and lots of planning establishments, research stations, places where people live. So I'm very familiar with the process, even though I'm not familiar with the details of this particular proposal. The concern I have, and I heard the, the engineer or the presenter, the planner, speaking to the effect that there are some things that have been thought through. And I've, I've figured that if that is the case, then let's put the brake. I'm for development and my work, and I've worked in maybe over 54 countries, working with those kinds of development, pushes me to think holistically about the plan so that the development you would have would be perfect. And years from now, people will say, wow, council did a great job in reviewing, not in halting, no, but in reviewing and in ensuring that proper planning was done. The concern I have, and I heard I'm not sure who I heard speak, whether it was Madam Mayor or somebody, saying that we are under pressure from political up there, that we have to do that. But that doesn't mean we have to rubber stamp 
whatever is being said. And it doesn't mean that if a proposal that hasn't been thought properly, and there's been lots of good proposals that have been put at the table, it doesn't mean that we push them aside. You are in a position of authority to, de to decide one way or another. And I pray, I trust that you will not just rubber stamp something that hasn't been thought through. No consultation has been made with the Baldwin Place people. I suggest that you require that. Issues of traffic and security and, and uh, all of those things need to be done. Finally, I would say one thing. I'm going to borrow it from the Bible. Jesus was teaching the disciple and the people. He told them, you have heard it said that, that was the law. But I tell you that, and that was grace. And it doesn't matter that the, the province or the county or whatever force laws on you. There are lots of ways with which those laws could be studied, could be mitigated, could be done properly. And then you will stand tall because you've done the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions from council to planning, or are we ready to put a resolution on the floor? I am going to turn it over to Councillor Parker. This is an extremely lengthy resolution. Please allow Councillor Parker uh, the courtesy to get the entire motion on the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Gilvez. Just for the public, you will hear a lot at the beginning. There are conditions at the end of the resolution. So please let me get through it so that you hear what you want to hear. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Rosehart. The Council approve in principle the zone change application, file number ZN722-05, submitted by Victoria Wood, Tilsonburg West GP, Inc., for lands legally described as part of lots eight and nine concession 11 Durham and part of lot eight concession 12 Durham in the town of Tilsonburg to rezone the lands R2 SP, R3 SP, R M S P, R H S P, OS1 and OS2 with appropriate holding zones to facilitate the proposed draft plan of subdivision. And that Council advised County Council that the town supports the application to amend official plan file number OP221117, submitted by Victoria Wood, Tilsonburg West GP, Inc., for lands legally described as part of lot 8, 9, concession 11, Durham, and part of lot 8, concession 12, Durham, in the town of Tilsonburg to amend the location and extent of the high, medium, low density residential areas on the subject lands to facilitate a draft plan of subdivision. And that after consideration and due diligence by Council to citizen safety, traffic volumes, and EMS access, the Council of the Town of Tilsonburg recommends the approval of draft plan of subdivision file number SB22-01-7, submitted by Victoria Wood, Tilsonburg West GP, for lands legally described as part of lots 8 and 9, concession 11 Durham, and part of lot 8, concession 12 Durham, in the Town of Tilsonburg, consisting of 32 blocks for low-density residential development, two blocks for medium-density residential development, one block for high-density residential development, one park block, one open space block, served by 10 new local streets, subject to the conditions of draft plan approval as stated in the staff report CP 2023-80, dated March 27th, 2023. Plus, the addition of the following conditions are met and satisfied by Council. The construction vehicles to enter into the proposed development from Concession Street onto Street A with the intention to minimize disruption to current neighborhoods and residents and that all in the vicinity be kept clean of construction material, garbage, debris, dirt, mud, gravel during construction for the safety of all citizens. And Due to the proximity of the crosswalk located in front of Westfield Public School, Council directs that Esseltine Drive not be extended as a through road due to safety and congestion in the area. And that Council recommends to straighten Street F to allow easier access for EMS 
and that traffic calming measures be put in place to slow traffic on Street F and that council supports Durham Drive and Grandview Drive be developed as through roads to access the proposed development. And that council recommends that as many large and existing trees as possible around the perimeter of the property be maintained and safe and free from demolition or root damage. And that for every tree removed, it be replaced on top of the one tree per lot requirement. And that council directs the access through point at Street I to Weston Drive be eliminated. And that the request that the number of dwelling units per multiple unit dwellings not apply to any stacked townhouses or back to back townhouses on block 33 and 34 special medium density residential uh, units or residential be denied. I'd like to speak to that, Madam Mayor. Go ahead. We still thought we didn't need to keep going. <laughs> um, I think that this resolution speaks to a lot of the concerns that uh, the neighborhood has brought forward. It is more about being good neighbors and coming up with ideas and making sure that everything suits the existing neighborhoods that are already in place. Um, I spoke about it earlier when I was speaking with the developer, and I think that uh, we need to take into consideration the people that have been in our community and let our community grow to be as special as it is. We need to keep the sanctity of that. So um, that's where I'm going to leave it, and uh, we'll be there. Thank you, Councillor Parker. Um, does any other councillor have any comments or questions? No, <laughs> this was a long one. I'm going to tell you a lot of work went into this. Um, this council had a lot on their plate, a lot to digest. We've listened to concerns. We appreciate safety factors. Um, you know, and I had reiterated in many emails, we hear you. You know, we do we do listen and, and take things seriously. Um, I do have one question and it is regard to Parkland. Um, and I'm going to ask Eric, but it's Parkland requirements have been reduced, am I correct, under Bill 23? The parkland requirements have been reduced for larger buildings, primarily when you get over 10 stories for an apartment building. Um, but for, right, for this subdivision development, it remains at the 5% of the subdivision, either in land or cash. Right. Okay. So it has, so basically that parkland is the maximum amount that is required. Correct. And it's affordable housing where there's no parkland required anymore. I think if I remember correctly. That's correct. So the, this plan actually provides above the 5%. The park itself is the 5%, plus it has the uh, corridors in between uh, the blocks uh, as additional parkland. Okay. Thank you. So, um, any further questions? Seeing none, I'm going to call the vote. All those in, in favor of the uh, red um, resolution. And that would be unanimous and carry. Council, sorry, I just have to close out. Just remember with Selena Planning Meeting, Council has approved in principle the zone change application ZN722-05, subject to approvals by County Oxford County Council. A bylaw will be brought forward at a future meeting and following its passing, there will be a 20-day appeal period. So thank you. Council is going to rise for a five minute recess because I think there might be some people that want to vacate the premises. 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Okay, so we'll, we'll be back at 823. Oh, I, I, I would like to stand with me.
<laughs> um, we're ready to start if counselors will take their seat. Okay, so we're, we're gonna move along here. Um, next, we're doing planning application for official plan amendment, OP 22-27-7. Uh, this is a public meeting held under the Planning Act for the purpose of hearing zone change applications at N7-22-10. This process allows any person in attendance the opportunity to speak to the application. If anyone who appeals this decision has not provided counsel with oral or written submissions at the public meeting, then the local planning appeal tribunal has the power to dismiss the appeal. If you speak to this application, please state your name and sign your name and street address on the sheet at the podium. Uh, now turn it over to Eric, who will give a overview of the zone change application. Thank you. This is another uh, combined applications official plan amendment, uh, draft plan subdivision and zone change to allow for the uh, creation of 80 lots for single detached dwellings, 16 blocks for 83 townhouse dwellings, one block for future medium density development uh, in a new residential plan and subdivision. Uh, the proposed official plan amendment would uh, redesignate block 104 of the plan, uh, an interior block uh, from low density to medium density residential to facilitate the future development of a 56 unit uh, condominium consisting of uh, townhouse dwellings. Uh, the subdivision itself is designated uh, low density residential. Uh, it's about 33 acres in size and there's no buildings or structures present on the property. Uh, the applicant submitted in support of the application, uh, again, a functional servicing report, a plan justification report, archeological assessment report, an environmental impact study, a transportation impact study, and a geotechnical and slope stability uh, report and analysis. Uh, this subdivision, uh, there is no additional parkland dedication required. The developer uh, in the previous, the previous developer in the uh, last phase of Rolling Meadows uh, deeded uh, the L-shaped parcel adjacent to the uh, the existing park uh, to the town back in 1997. So no additional parkland is required in this regard. Um, they are taking a small portion of that uh, uh, existing park lot and making it into a sediment storage area, a drying area for the stormwater management pond. Uh, but they are providing a trail network uh, through blocks uh, 98, 90, 97, 98, 99, and 100 uh, through the plan. Uh, so those will uh, be in excess of the 5% parkland dedication requirement. The submitted traffic study for uh, this development uh, considered both this development and the adjacent development uh, to the east uh, at the same time. So the, the study did take those two. It's the same, the same uh, firm authored both reports, but they, they did include uh, both studies or both developments, as well as all of the existing development and planned development on North Street. Uh, identified that uh, some intersection improvements are required uh, to uh, facilitate the proposed development. And uh, they are uh, westbound turning movement um, on Broadway and North Street. Uh, they'll need to uh, extend the uh, left turn movement storage, some 40 meters. And as well as on North Street and Colthard or Broad Avenue, uh, they'll need an additional uh, storage in the additional left turn lane. Um, and this can be accommodated within the existing uh, street width. Uh, the conditions and recommendations of the traffic study are included as conditions of draft approval. The environmental impact study was submitted and was peer reviewed again uh, to the town and in, in, um, by the town and county. The, there's uh, 0.24 hectares of woodland proposed to be removed. Um, that is to accommodate the alignment of street C uh, shown on the plan. Uh, that is a east-west uh, plan collector road. Um, it's been identified since at least the uh, 1999. It was identified in the 2005 Stantec uh, North Tilsonburg servicing strategy. 
So the the uh, there's some woodland removal that have to occur both on this parcel and the uh, adjacent subdivision to the east to provide for that uh, connection. As well, the uh, collector is eventually proposed to extend out through the uh, driving course range uh, to the west, uh, out to a new signalized intersection on Broadway. Uh, the timing of that part of the uh, collector uh, road being constructed is unknown. Uh, staff did have some conversations with some potential development plans with the owner of that parcel, and they were made aware of the requirement for that collector road, uh, but likely it won't, that connection won't occur until those lands are developed. Uh, the EIS also uh, uh, reviewed the proposed removal of some woodlands for uh, sediment storage for the swim pond, as well as an outlet for the swim pond, which will go into the existing creek and ravine. Uh, and it the EIS also included a number of recommendations and mitigation measures uh, that are covered off in the conditions of draft approval. Uh, the functional servicing report indicated that uh, the site can be, can be serviced with uh, municipal water and wastewater services. There are some water main upgrades required and the applicant is aware of this and is working with Oxford County Public Works to determine the timing and uh, location. The existing water mains may not accommodate the required fire flows for the development. So the county and applicant are working on some uh, six possible upgrades to optimize the flows in the area. Uh, so there are conditions of draft approval for cost sharing agreements and uh, which will be negotiated through future subdivision agreements. Uh, sanitary servicing is available through connections to uh, the existing sanitary sewer on Bobolink, which conveys flows down Tanager and to the recently constructed uh, sanitary pumping station on North Street. And municipal storm sewers are required. Uh, the outlet for the storm sewers will be the uh, swim pond located in the southeast corner of the site, which will upflow to an existing creek. Uh, with respect to the proposed medium density block, the uh, eventual dwelling type is likely uh, townhouses through a future plan of condominium application. Uh, the preliminary site plan shows 56 units, uh, which is within the permitted density of the medium density policies. Staff for the opinion that the, the designation of that medium density block uh, does comply with the official plan criteria for the identification of new medium density sites. And the block is uh, will be adequately serviced from the new infrastructure in the plan of subdivision and will be large enough to provide the required parking and amenity areas. And no parking relief has been required for this medium density block. Within the low density residential area, there's a mix of dwelling types proposed including single detached dwellings and townhouse dwellings. The uh, net residential density is 25 uh, units per hectare, which is less than the maximum of 30 units per hectare. Um, abutting existing development on uh, Bobolink, the developer is proposing to uh, zone those properties to R1A zone, which would only permit a single detached dwelling. As well, there's currently four street stubs uh, into this development. And uh, based on feedback received um, from uh, town and county staff, um, the two of those stubs, uh, one opposite Robin Road and another one uh, in between uh, Robin Road and Woodcock, uh, those two lots are, those are supposed to be used for single detached dwelling lots uh, that would remain uh, zoned R1 to match the existing development. And the new street connection would be um, farther to the west on uh, opposite Woodcock, as well as to the east on Bobolink, which is the um, natural drainage uh, flow for the uh, gravity sewers. The requested zoning for the medium density block again has the uh, relief, request relief of the distance between buildings, which again, a staff have identified this to be looked at through a future Housekeeping update because this seems to be an impediment to medium density development uh, throughout the town, as well as this block will be subject to site plan approval where matters such as lot grading, servicing, access, parking, and landscaping will be satisfied to, uh, to the town and county. 
the reductions in the front yard and rear yard depth and open space uh, will apply to the outside of the development. Um, they'll be served by a private internal uh, condominium street, which will provide uh, all of the required parking. The requested zoning for the townhouse blocks is similar to the zoning uh, in uh, Northcrest phase one and phase two. Uh, with an exception, there's now a proposed increased driveway width uh, that will allow more of the front yard to be paved and used for a driveway, which will provide some additional parking opportunities for the units. And the, uh, the other relief required will uh, basically facilitate uh, the successful townhouse developments uh, in the area. The zoning provisions for the single attached dwellings would uh, provide for increased lot coverage and reduced exterior side yard widths for the lots that back onto Bobble Link or existing development. Uh, the other single attached dwelling lots would provide for increased lot coverages, exterior side yard widths, reduced interior side yard widths, rear yard depths, and increased projections, which is similar to uh, other developments in the town in this area. Uh, there is also a request to permit additional residential units. Um, in the in on these fully single detached dwellings, um, and the the only stipulation to that is uh, based on the criteria in the Planning Act that uh, one additional parking space be provided, and that that parking space can be uh, provided at uh, in tandem. Uh, in light of this, staff are, are supportive of the application and recommend approval subject to the noted conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, are there any questions from council to the planner? Council Rosart. Um, and again, I, I threw you, Madam Mayor, to Eric. And again, we're looking at traffic and the flow of track and, and it being clogged and plugged and congested. So I'm just wondering why, again, we're not looking at doing roundabouts to keep the traffic flowing. I don't understand why Tilsmerk doesn't look at roundabouts. I think in this case, there may be opportunity for a roundabout at Street C and Street B or Street C and Woodcock uh, in the subdivision, but I don't think there's enough uh, space. Uh, maybe Jonathan can correct me, but on Bobolink and Woodcock or Rob or uh, Bob Lincoln Street A for a roundabout in the existing subdivision. Just you'd have to buy land, expropriate it from the existing residential properties to come with the roundabout. But in this, the new plan, there, there may be enough space on Street C. Just to follow up, Mr. Madam Mayor, through to Eric, is this something that the town would have to put in a bylaw if that's what we want in subdivisions? Through you, Madam Mayor, to uh, Councilor Rosehart, uh, there's certainly provisions for best practices as it relates to roundabouts. Um, I may have the wrong proposed draft plan, but one of the visions or one of the uh, plans that I have actually has a roundabout exactly where the planner was suggesting. Um, so I, I'm getting the nod from the applicant as well, too. So I believe we are incorporating that. In this uh, correlation, it's directly related to two collector roads, similar to the discussion from the last plan of subdivision, but that didn't only had one collector merging. Uh, so there is a proposed roundabout for this plan of subdivision, but to your point, it won't really be in effect and in use until future phase outs or build outs to the west when the connection happens ultimately to the arterial on Broadway Street. But that is the intention is that we will be incorporating more roundabouts. It has been a discussion with the manager of engineering. Uh, and so we'll be incorporating those design elements in terms of traffic calming. Just a follow up, Madam Mayor, sir. At this time, there's nothing in any of these subdivisions that we're planning a roundabout inside the subdivision. Nothing. Just going going towards not in the future, not now. Right. Through you, Madam Mayor, in this plan of subdivision that's being considered tonight, the revised draft plan has the inclusion of one uh, roundabout, which it would. I'm gonna just sorry, my apologies. Is um, is it would would it talk is, and talk street, and street C, C on yeah. the northwest? Thank, Thank you. you. Actually, uh, glad to see the inclusion of that. I'm also glad to hear about the wider driveways. 
so we can try and get some vehicles off of the roads. Are there any um, other questions or concerns to the planner? Seeing none, um, <clears throat> there is now an opportunity um, for the public, the applicant or agent to speak in favor of the application. And uh, who's the lucky speaker tonight? Your duo. Welcome to the front. And just state your names for for everyone, just so they're aware. Thank you. Um, Andrea is here with me, and uh, I'm Will Hayhoe, the applicant and uh, developer. And I just wanted to introduce myself and thank uh, Council for considering the application. And um, certainly for those who are here in the audience, uh, our engineer and Andrew to Andrea to um, assist and they've guided us and we've had great cooperation in preparing this application um, uh, with the uh, particularly the engineering services department and the parks department and, and the integration the existing park and so on. So I, I believe we brought forth a very favorable application and a Andrea will speak to that. And I just wanted to introduce myself because we think of ourselves not just as a, a developer, but more of a community builder where we actually build the homes that are developed. And that allows for some integration and, and cooperation. Um, for instance, I know there's a topic of, okay, how this construction vehicle is going to get there. And, and we can, we've done it before and working cooperatively with the town and various uh, communities where uh, you know, staff designate what route they want us to use, and, and we use it, and we, we work cooperatively. So I just want to affirm that we'll keep on doing that. Thank you. Thank you. And I do have a presentation. Um, there's a presentation. I did bring a USB just in case. Okay. Thank you. Good evening again. Uh, I'm not a Boy Scout, but I try to be prepared, so I'm glad I had that USB. Uh, again, my name is Andrea Sinclair, uh, and I will uh, just go through, thanks for the introduction, Will, um, this proposed plan of subdivision. Okay, this is the proposed draft plan that's currently before you for consideration. It is comprised of predominantly single detached townhouse and cluster townhouse units. So I don't have to talk as close now that we're a smaller group, uh, as well as open space blocks planned for trail connections, park access, natural features, and stormwater management. I don't know what that means. Um, Sorry, it's just not advancing. There we go. Uh, so in terms of the road connections, this has already been discussed, so I won't go into great detail, but currently um, we're providing two connections to the south and in the future of time, there will be additional connections to the east, west and north, which will allow for um, traffic movements as the areas around potentially redevelopment uh, redevelop. This is the uh, intersection discussed, so it has been sized and designed so that it can accommodate, um, I wouldn't call it a full roundabout, more of a turning circle at this scale um, to help advance. And again, the number of units in this proposed draft plan really doesn't uh, trigger or warrant a turning circle, but this is proposed just given what may happen in the future and making sure that those traffic movements um, can move well through the neighborhood. Just pointing out in terms of the unit breakdown, so everything shown in sort of the yellow color are the single detached, so um, well dispersed throughout the neighborhood, we wanted to make sure that the townhouses and the single detached are sort of interconnected, so each area of the plan has that uh, variety. There's a total of 80 single detached proposed 
And then in terms of townhouses, the large central block is proposed to be, uh, I'll call it a cluster townhouse development. So it'll go through a future site plan um, phase and will be I likely condominiumized. And then the other areas in the sort of orangey color represent the street townhouses that are proposed. So uh, approximately 83 street fronting townhouses and uh, we haven't determined the final layout for the multiple block, but it's estimated to be probably about another 56 units could be accommodated within that block. Uh, in terms of the natural features, stormwater management trails, um, one of the key design considerations when uh, designing the subdivision and, and for Hey Ho Homes was to make sure there was a really connected trail open space park network. Um, and all of the open space blocks and the trail block, which is this east-west connection, was purposely located so it would tie in with the park, it would tie in with a loop through the stormwater management and would connect into the existing park. And then additional trails are proposed um, where supported through the open space feature. And there was sort of a broader um, connection. So this in yellow sort of shows the movements through this particular draft plan of subdivision. But in terms of the broader community, there are other existing trails shown in purple and other future planned trails shown in yellow. So it really wanted to make sure that um, this subdivision was very walkable, that it was very connected to things that are happening to the, uh, the east and the south. And again, that informed a lot of the design decisions when preparing this draft plan. Um, this is outside of the draft plan, but we thought it would be uh, helpful to share and to show council. This is the um, existing park off Bobbling Drive and this is a proposal that um, I understand our, our client is um, looking at doing is in terms of having a little bit better access and some parking right along the frontage of that park and that's something that um, they'll be working with the town on in terms of having that um, better access, a little bit of on-street parking. And while it's not part of, technically part of this application, um, as we'll mention, they're community builders and they want to do this um, to benefit the broader community. And then in terms of the natural feature um, and restoration and compensation, as Eric mentioned, there was an EIS done and it was peer reviewed. And we wanted to ensure that any removal of vegetation, and, and that includes removal of vegetation as a result of these potential future road crossings that we would be doing uh, sufficient amounts of replanting and compensation. So when you see the comparison of the draft plan that was originally submitted on the left and what's before you today, what you'll see as the biggest changes, uh, we had a number of very deep lots along um, streets and sorry, street C. Uh, those have now been significantly reduced in depth so that all of this area down here could be added to the open space block. So we're now actually um, have a much larger area of uh, open space than what was originally prepared. And it's also more than compensating for what's being removed. So there will actually be um, more vegetation as a result of the subdivision than what's there currently. And that open space block, um, if you're a numbers person, increased in size from about 1.76 hectares to 2.09 hectares. So it's an increase of about 0.82 acres if you're think more in terms of acres. And that might have been my buzzer. I don't know. Um, I'm about done anyways. So just wanted to share that because I think that's important for council to see how much more open space has been brought into this final plan. And uh, just in terms of some of the implementation measures, in terms of sidewalks will be provided, street trees will be provided, um, the tree preservation plans will be done as a draft plan condition. Uh, we expect homeowner brochures will be provided where you're backing on to open space. And any recommendations from technical reports will be implemented. So thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Does Council, Councillor Rosehart and then Councillor Parker. Thank you, Madam Mayor, through you, the, the speaker. So the ponding, is that going to be where the green space is now? So the, I just moved to the draft plan, so it's easier to see. So this uh, swim pond will be, it's already uh, green space now and a portion, a small portion of it's in the park block. So as mentioned by Eric, that portion that's um, going to come out of the park block is being made up for by this screen section and the and the trail. So it's um, actually an over dedication right now of parkland, but that's where the stormwater management block will be. And there will be sort of a trail loop around it. A follow up, Adam Mayor. So that is, so the new subdivision that's going in there now, 
there's there was ponds back there that isn't on that land this is on our land where the park is where the trees were there's a bush area in there is that that was parkland right yeah the this was uh, a portion of this was parkland and i don't have the exact how yeah thank you so the part that you're thinking hi andrew Golvesi. um so the part that you're thinking of is the park is actually here and actually only extends to about this here area here this this area that is going to be the swim pond is actually cultivated field right now there is no trees where where the majority of the park is going there's a little bit around the perimeter um, up and through here but very very little most of the pond is going in actually farmland right now Along with Madam Mayor, I'm, I'm just trying to, to focus on that. Is that by Tanninger or no. is that further up from Tanninger? Further up. Tanninger's right here. So this is quite a bit north. There's two homes right here. The pond will be right in this area. Right now, the existing park that you're thinking of is in here. So the existing park will be removed. No, will oh, remain. It will remain. Will remain. The part that is that is mowed grass right now will remain. And the bush area, is that going to be gone? No, that bush area all remains up and through here, down through here, and then through here. And then there's there, this is mostly grass with sporadic trees through here. And then just to follow up, Madam Mayor, and then the water from the ponding that you're doing, where is that going to drain to? That's going to drain through towards, there's a natural water course that flows through the center of here. So there will be an outlet that's constructed I'm going to say maybe here that comes from the pond that goes to the natural water course. And then just to follow up, that will flow into behind all the houses on Tanager to North Street? Yes, the, the drainage channel that was that was recently reconstructed by Northwest Phase 2, it'll flow into that drainage channel. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Parker. Through you, uh, Mayor Gilbazy, more of a comment than a question. Um, I actually appreciate uh, the expanded uh, green space that you guys have brought forward than what is actually required. It's uh, very nice to see a developer uh, go down that road. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Parker. I echo those sentiments as well. Is there um, anyone else that has any questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. There is now an opportunity for anyone in attendance to speak in opposition to the application. I am seeing none. Are there any further questions to staff? I'm seeing none. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Councillor Parker, who has a resolution to put on the floor. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Rosehart. The, the Council of the Town of Tilson, or sorry, before, uh, just for Council's uh, recollection, I did send out an amended amendment that I made to this from the previous emails from Eric earlier today. So. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Rosehart. The Council of the Town of Tilsonburg approve in principle the zone change application file number ZN72210 submitted by Performance Communities Realty Inc. for lands legally described as part of lot six, concession 10, Durham, and blocks 18 through 21, plan 41M148 in the Town of Tilsonburg to rezone the lands R1. R1A SP, R2 SP, R3 SP, RM SP, OS1, and OS2 with appropriate holding zones to facilitate the proposed draft plan of subdivision. And the Council of the Town of Tilsonburg advise County Council that the town supports the application to amend the county official plan file number OP22277 submitted by Performance Communities Realty Inc. for lands legally described as part of lot six concession 10 Durham and blocks 18 through 21 plan 41 M148 in the town of Tilsonburg to redesignate a portion of the subject lands from low density residential to medium density residential to facilitate a future medium density residential block within a proposed draft plan of subdivision. And further, that the Council of the Town of Tilsonburg advise County Council that the town supports the application for draft plan of subdivision file number SB 22037, submitted by Performance Communities Realty Inc. for lands legally described as part of Lot 6, Concession 10, Durham, and Blocks 18 through 21, Plan 41M 
148 in the town of Tilsonburg consisting of 80 lots for single detached dwellings, 16 lots for townhouse dwellings, one block for medium density residential development, six open space blocks, one stormwater block served by three new local streets and the extension of Woodcock Drive subject to the condition conditions of draft draft approval outlined in report number CP 2023-81 and subject to the following conditions set out by Council. That the concerns highlighted as followed with regards to the traffic study by Paradigm be included in the RFP for the Master Transportation Plan and for Broadway and North Street, the westbound left turn movement is forecast to operate with 95th percentile Ks exceeding the available storage of 40 meters during the AM peak hour. These Ks can be accommodated with the existing two-way center left turn lane on North Street and at the North Street and Coldhouse Street. North Street and Coldhart Street slash Braun Avenue. The southbound left turn movement is forecast to operate with LOSE and a VC ratio of 0.47 during the PM peak hour. The low VC ratio indicates the delay is likely due to high volumes of traffic through North Street, which limits the number of available gaps for side street traffic. And the staff investigate the creation of an access road for construction vehicles to limit the impact on the existing completed neighborhoods. Questions from Council, Councillor Luciani. Oh, through Madam Mayor to uh, Councillor Parker. I'm just wondering whether the uh, the last portion dealing with the uh, master transportation plan and the RFP should that be part of this, or should that be separate as in regard to the uh, when we get to uh, dealing with the master transportation plan? Uh, actually, we can make an amendment with the seconder and I'll remove it and I can actually put it in a notice of motion that I have later on tonight. Um, so we will remove those two paragraphs and uh, it'll speak to the master transportation plan then. Great, thank you. So is everyone agreeable to removing? So can you identify which two paragraphs? And for Broadway and North Street would be the first one, and that North Street and Coldhouse Street will remove both those paragraphs. He's going to move this to a notice of motion later. Yeah. And actually, it should actually be the concerns highlighted as follows with regards to the traffic study should also yeah. be removed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now council, any questions on the amended? Does the mover change the motion? So we will call a vote. So that's with those three paragraphs removed. Uh, all those in favor? And that is carried. Council has approved in principle the zone change application ZN 7-22-10, subject to approvals by Oxford County Council. A bylaw will be brought forward at a future meeting date and following is its passing, there will be a 20 day appeal period. Oh, congratulations. So, just have to find the next planning application here. We are now on 8.3 application OP 22-19-7. This is a public meeting held under the Planning Act for the purpose of hearing zone change application ZN 7-22-15. The process allows any person in attendance the opportunity to speak to the application. If anyone who appeals this decision has not provided counsel with oral or written submissions at the public meeting, then the local planning appeal tribunal has the power to dismiss the appeal. If you speak to this application, please state your name and sign your name and street address on the sheet at the podium. I'll now turn it over to Eric, who, who will give an overview of the zone change application. Thank you. This again is uh, three applications to facilitate a residential draft plan of subdivision. The uh, overall purpose is to create 15 blocks for a residential development and one block for a future medium density development and a new residential plan of subdivision. Uh, the proposed official plan amendment will amend the extent of the open space designation to coincide with the findings in the environmental impact study prepared for the development, as well as to facilitate a medium density residential block in the northeast portion of the property. The draft plan subdivision consists of 15 blocks for low density residential development, a block for the future medium density development, four open space blocks served by five new local streets, 
and the extension of Martin Street, Braun Avenue, and Mallard Avenue. The lands are approximately 70.9 acres, and they're immediately to the north and east of uh, an existing draft approved plan of subdivision uh, known as Lynn Prop Phase One. Uh, there's no buildings or structures currently present on the property. Uh, so there's going to be that medium density block is proposed to be a condominium corporation in the future. So there'll be a crossing of that existing water course. Uh, the conservation authority's concerns at this point are that uh, the applicant hasn't demonstrated that there'll be safe access from that block in times of flooding. Uh, so staff recommend that uh, the portions of the of these applications affecting uh, that block north of the water course be deferred. Uh, until the applicant has provided additional confirmation. Uh, similar to last application, the transportation impact study prepared by uh, Paradigm uh, made some recommendations, uh, which are included as uh, conditions of draft approval. Uh, there was a noise and vibration assessment conducted uh, due to the uh, presence of the railway, uh, which is uh, still in operation, as well as the uh, uh, operation of vehicles on North Street. Uh, the study identified that a berm is required and a, or a berm and noise barrier um, parallel to the railway and also recommended a 40 meter setback to the railway for any residential building foundations. Um, it also recommended uh, a number of warning clauses be included uh, for lots that are in this area adjacent to the railway or lots that are in proximity to North Street East. And this is uh, carried off or um, implemented through conditions of draft approval. Uh, the environmental impact study that was submitted in support of the application was reviewed, uh, peer reviewed. Uh, again, it was uh, required because of the presence of significant wetlands, valley lands, and fish habitat. Uh, there'll be approximately uh, 2.4 hectares of vegetation to be removed. Majority of that is to, imp is to facilitate that planned collector road uh, to the west. Uh, that'll go down to Braun Avenue and, and eventually uh, to North Street. Uh, the conditions of the uh, EIS and the mitigation measures, um, they are again uh, included as uh, conditions of draft approval. Uh, the functional servicing report uh, indicated that uh, Again, similar to the application we previously heard, there's some water main upgrades that need to be uh, made to facilitate the development. And the applicant uh, is aware of that and will be working with Oxford County Public Works uh, to make that happen. Uh, sanitary servicing is available and will occur through existing connections uh, to sanitary sewers on Braun Avenue, Martin Street, and Mallard Street, which will convey the sanitary uh, sewage uh, to the new pumping station on North Street. Uh, in this case, there'll be a, an existing swim pond of the uh, draft approved plan to the south uh, was designed to take into these uh, to take these lands. Uh, so there will be a condition that the previous subdivision plan has to be developed uh, or portions that have to be developed prior to this application uh, being registered. Uh, this application doesn't have. Uh, uh, individual lots proposed similar to the first one we heard tonight. Uh, this this is a application of blocks. Uh, the blocks uh, could range um, from uh, up to 300 unit residential units in the low density area, and uh, the medium density block could accommodate 222 units uh, based on the uh, uh, density that's proposed. Uh, there are uh, public trail connections provided throughout the development. Uh, the applicant, the parkland uh, on this plan isn't uh, hasn't been determined yet. Uh, the applicant's been working with the town's uh, director of recreation, culture, and parks uh, to provide a suitable location. 
Um, it's expected that it'll be in this, the southeast corner adjacent to North Street. Um, they're just working through the, the final uh, details of that. Uh, that would provide a, a good uh, pedestrian connection uh, to sidewalks on North Street, as well as the, uh, the rail trail that's uh, located in that area. Uh, there is a condition of draft approval included or recommended to be included uh, that does require uh, the applicant to provide parkland either a medication or cash and loan to the satisfaction of the town. Uh, the other location for parkland was really identified by the applicant uh, was deemed uh, to be unsuitable for actual parkland development by the EIS. Uh, so that's the reason why uh, there's the change in the original submission. Uh, the proposed zoning uh, for the townhouses is similar to the zoning requested in the previous application. Uh, this application also includes the increased driveway width uh, uh, of up to 84% of the lot frontage uh, for parking purposes. Uh, and again, uh, ARUs are requested uh, for the single attached dwellings um, in the in the in the uh, sub plan of subdivision. Uh, the other requested uh, zoning reductions for the um, for the uh, low density uh, uh, low density blocks in the plan uh, can be considered appropriate and are typical of the existing and planned development in this area of North Street. Um, there's a portion of the plan that's actually within the township of South West Oxford. Um, it is currently zoned A2 in the township zoning bylaw. And no change to that. Uh, those lands will uh, will occur. Um, they would be created if the plan was registered, anyways. Uh, so we staff just recommend that a one foot reserve be included to ensure that uh, services cannot be extended uh, out to that portion. Although it's noted that it, it currently it's just wooded, and there's no change proposed to that. So generally, staff are supportive of the application, uh, both subject to the modification for to accommodate uh, parkland as well as uh, provide um, additional opportunity uh, to the applicant to provide detail regarding that median density block north of the water course, just to ensure that safe access and egress can be provided for that block. Uh, once that confirmation is provided, it'd be brought back to a future council meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Are there any questions? Councillor Parsons. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's been a long meeting. I, I don't know if you, I know I knew you did address the concern from the Director of uh, Parks Recreation, and it sounds like that's being worked on. Uh, I, I'm not in favor of cash and lieu. I hope, I hope uh, we don't have cash and lieu. We need parkland for this development and, and every development where there's uh, this many residents. There's also concerns from the building and bylaw services. Did you address that in your comments? Um, The applicant suggested OS2 SP zoning, which would permit an accessory structure within the recommended buffer area identified in EIS subject to an arborist report is not feasible. Is that, is that being addressed by the developer? Thank you, Madam Mayor, to Councillor Parsons. So we, we did uh, broach that subject with, it, with the developer. And uh, we, you know, communicated that the building department doesn't have the staff or resources or time to review arborist reports. And typically in the town, uh, we've always zoned those spaces and rear yards that are subject to the buffer to be uh, passive use open space. Uh, so that's included in the recommendation. And I believe the applicant and developer is okay with that at this point. Any further questions? Seeing none, there is now an opportunity for the public, the applicant, or agent to speak in favor of the application. Peter, welcome. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council, and uh, staff. I don't know if Amelia is able to put the, uh, the draft plan up for us tonight. Uh, no, we're things. having technical difficulties. My wife is watching at home, and she said that uh, she can't see it. <laughs> I think we're still streaming, but I'm not sure. Oh, it's audio. Yeah. 
Amelia says we're still streaming, just so everyone knows we are still streaming. Um, but okay, I'll speak to the subdivision here. Uh, Eric did a great job uh, going through everything. I uh, can't say I had anything to uh, pick apart with that. And the development is going to look very similar to uh, North Crest Phase 2, which was uh, an originally uh, Linprop uh, subdivision and that uh, uh, Heho said uh, developed, and also to the south, uh, Lind uh, south North, North Crest Phase 1, sorry, uh, similar uh, density we're looking at with that. So it'll be a mix of townhouses. Uh, we were around 70% townhouses in both of those developments, and that's, again, what we're targeting with this. Uh, we left it as blocks, and I know when we did the previous phase for Lynn Prop Phase 1, which is uh, approved last year, uh, Council did uh, uh, ask about it, and on this plan you can see all the lotting and the townhouses and uh, and all the single family for Phase 1 that's been added to it, and we came very close to the uh, density targets that we had, we had spoke of at that time. A uh, couple things that uh, with the traffic reported it recommended uh mallard be made a collector uh only up as far as street d and uh, hopefully I, you you'll have access to the plans there um and then uh, comments from town staff they had asked that mallard be uh, continued as a collector uh, all the way up to street c and then across back to bronze so that we have a collector going around the outside there and there is a significant medium density portion that's being built along the east side of the property and Eric mentioned up to 220 units could go in there and we did do a concept plan that uh, could meet all the required setbacks it was with stacked townhouses and it could be knocked down a little bit but we still need to meet that medium density uh, requirement through there uh, one of the rezoning things uh, that happened with the street F had uh, uh, was zoned as medium density, and we've moved that all along the east side now. So street F of phase one was dropped down to uh, low density, uh, but overall uh, we've increased the medium density area. The part that the conservation authority was questioning across the creek to the northeast there. Uh, again, that's all uh, a medium density piece, and that it's it's zoned open space, or the official plan had, had it that way, and uh, it was actually farmed land. And if you go uh, look at the aerial photography from uh, a number of years ago, that was all farmed. It had a driveway that was built through there, uh, but with the larger equipment, it uh, became impractical for the size of it. But uh, uh, it did have uh, a designation for future development, so we have shown this uh, development. It would be one-sided. We still have to maintain the buildings 40 feet, uh, 40 meters away from the railway, uh, so there would be a, a, a road that goes alongside uh, uh, the railway and actually some green space that we could uh, do some plantings along there. So we'll uh, work towards uh, satisfying the conservation authority with the access across the creek and uh, have to bring that back at, at a future date. Uh, Councilor Rosehart, we did get a roundabout on this one. Uh, there was one on the previous phase on Braun at uh, Street C and B, they intersect there. And this one's up at the north and uh, Street G. Uh, so that's the intersection of two collectors there, and that heads uh, west over to uh, the Rolling Meadow subdivision that we looked at uh, earlier. So there, there will be a roundabout, and there is one just before you exit uh, the Rolling Meadows there and continue out to Broadway eventually. So we are trying to put them in. <laughs> um, the... What else do I have? Uh, there was, uh, Eric did mention the water uh volumes here that we need and primarily it's not for the uh, domestic use but it is for fire flows there is a required uh connection across the rolling meadows uh subdivision uh, the north end and the county is working uh to, to also extend a piece at the north end of bobolink to connect to the 12 inch that runs uh alongside and behind sobe so 
uh, that's all been in the works and uh, is covered in uh, uh, various reports. Uh, so that is is a requirement to do the full build out of this. And the rest of the servicing, the sewers are all in good shape. Comment and questions about electrical. The electrical, there's no current concerns with the uh, ability to service this. The uh, infrastructure has been put in the ground with the switches and the phasing to service this subdivision with the previous phases. And we do uh, show uh, THI, the overall concept, so they can do that. Some of the other things that change in uh, servicing, there's the uh, overall transformation capacity from Hydro One, and that's always being advanced along. And the large industrial developments uh, that come along can consume a bunch as well. So the, there's no concerns with electrical servicing for the subdivision and THI had commented that uh, generally adding additional residential is uh, are, are low demands compared to the larger industrial demand. So that uh, currently there's no concerns. This should all be serviced if uh, if CFIS remains uh, successful in bringing uh, industry to town, then they, they may need more hydro overall, but uh, no concerns at this time yet. That's all I had. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Any questions from Council? Seeing that I guess you did such a good job, we don't have any questions. I think the <laughs> dragging it out with the previous ones may work in my favor. <laughs> Tired. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So um, now there's an opportunity for anyone in attendance to speak in opposition to the application. And I'm seeing none. Any further questions from council? Seeing none, Councilor Luciani. Move by myself and seconded by Councilor Parsons that uh, council approve in principle the zone change application file number ZN7-22-15 submitted by Lindrop Corp. Corporation Incorporated for the lands legally described as parts of lots four and five concession 10 Durham in the town of Tilsonburg, specifically the land south of the water course crossing on block 16 to rezone the lands R3-SP, RM-SP and OS2 with appropriate holding zones to facilitate the proposed draft plan of subdivision. And that council advise county council that town supports the application to amend the, count, the county official plan File number OP 22-19-7 submitted by Lindrop Corporation Incorporated for lands legally described as parts of lots four and five concession 10 Durham in the town of Tilsonburg, specifically the land south of the water course crossing on block 16 to redesignate a portion of the subject lands from open space and low density residential to medium density residential to facilitate a future medium density residential block within a proposed draft plan of subdivision. And that council advise County Council that the town supports the application for draft plan of sub subdivision file number SB 22-07-7 submitted by Lindrop Corporation for lands legally described as parts of lot four and five concession 10 Durham in the town of Tulsburg consisting of 15 blocks for low density residential development consisting of single detached dwellings, semi-detached dwellings and townhouse dwellings, one block for med future medium density residential development, four open space blocks served by five new local streets and the extension of Martin Street, Braun Street and Mallard Ave, subject to the conditions of draft approval as stated in staff report CP 2023-82 dated March 27th, 2023. Thank you, Councillor. Any questions? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? And that would be carried with none opposed. Council has approved in principle the zoning change applications at N7-22-15, subject to approvals by Oxford County Council. A bylaw will be brought forward at a future meeting date and following its passing, there will be a 20-day appeal period. Um, item 10.1, Lauren Johnson couldn't stay. And uh, we have Cedric as item 10.2, who's been waiting patiently for a very long time. Welcome. <laughs> Nobody left for me. Oh, you're getting it up. <laughs> well, thank you, Madam Mayor and uh, the Council. Thank you for listening. I'm pleased to bring you a little bit of lighter context of your evening. 
Um, and that's to do with the uh, Kinsman Club and, of course, our ever so famous um, Tilsonburg Kinsman Easter Egg Hunt. Um, again, the Tilsonburg Kinsman Club is all about serving the community's greatest needs. This is an event that we're ex extremely proud of, um, that we've been serving uh, to our community for the past three decades. Um, it's been an extremely widely participated event, and most um, record numbers really last year as we kind of got back to having events. Uh, in the past two years, actually, the Kinsman Club has worked extra hard to um, bring in more things to do at the Easter Egg Hunt. So it's not just like the 10 minutes of frantic children uh, flying all over the field and fighting each other for that little golden egg of chocolate. Uh, and we're just really proud of what we've brought and how the event has grown and how we'd like to get it to continue to grow. And we just really look forward to bringing that event um, more and more. Sorry, I guess I should be actually using the slides here that I'm talking about. And I put in all kinds of fancy transitions. Um, so we're really pleased to, to continue to bring that event. This is just a pull on your heartstrings because everybody likes kids that are smiling. Um, and that's what we get year after year after year. Uh, so with any growing event, we have additional requirements. In this particular case for us this year, it is by way of adding a few of the outdoor facilities that are located at the Memorial Park um, to be able to just, again, it's just to grow that event uh, as we grow, we need a little bit more space. We're planning on bringing in um, some additional uh, food options this year and things like that. So just taking more space and needing the pavilion. And we'd also like to use the band shell that is so uh, famously named after Kinsman. Um, so these assets are typically uh, rented by the town, uh, facilitated by the town at the community center. Um, those are the prices, $99.25 a piece, total $198.50. So basically, we're just coming to council tonight uh, as a recommendation by our Director of Parks and Rec to ask for those to be waived for this year and all future years, uh, as long as we continue to kind of host this event. Of course, um, should you know this council want to continue to see me year after year, I'm happy to come back and do this presentation uh again um but you know i i think you know we could call this like a life membership for this event only of course and uh just uh approve something this ask in principle i guess for this year and all future years further to that i think <clears throat> got nothing to do with that, what i'm asking but just for this council to maybe open up um that bylaw that exists around how we govern um, you know, facility rentals and, uh, you know, service organizations that are providing events to our community. And maybe we could take a look at that and allow some of our departments to, you know, I don't know, up to a certain value waive fees for certain facility rentals, as long as they fit a certain criteria or something. I think a policy could be looked at to achieve that so that, there's not this time that's being used uh, when you have obviously much more important matters to to handle. So that's all I have. Sorry to keep it so short, but I know we're uh, we're all gotten kind of weary and uh, just like council to consider that waiving of fees for the upcoming event and future events. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Um, I'll make a comment. I remember when um, it came back last year and all the, um, there were extremely positive comments all over social media. And I think coming out of COVID, people were just so excited to, to have this event. And um, I remember it, it being extremely positive. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll pass that on to our members. Councillor Spencer, you have a resolution? Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Parson, that Council received the delegation from the Tilsonburg Kinsmen as information 
and that the Memorial Park be donated free of charge for the use of the Easter egg hunt for the year of 2023. Thank you. Would you like to speak to that? Councillor Parsons. Okay. So um, I did think that Cedric, or Cedric has made, um, you know, a viable request that maybe we look at some sort of policy moving forward. So um, I think there is something right being looked at. Am I correct, Julie? Yes, she's shaking her head. Yes. All right, perfect. So um, if there's no questions, I will call the vote. All those in favor. And that would be carried. Next, we're moving on to an information item, which is a letter, and I'm going to turn it over to Councillor Parker, who has a resolution. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Rosehart that Council receives a letter to Council from Mike and Sandy Clover dated March 10th, 2023, as information, and that Council supports the decommissioning and sale of the CN Rail Cayuga line in Norfolk County from Fernley Road to Talbot Road, and that this resolution be forwarded to Norfolk County and SCORE. I'd like to speak to that, uh, Mayor. Um, so I had the opportunity to meet with Titan Trailers. Um, when we um, when we originally uh, recommissioned uh, the section of land, um, they owned the portion of industrial land that is covered by the railway. Um, however, um, this resolution itself doesn't speak to actually us physically closing it or giving permission to, it's just supporting their recommendation because they would actually like to purchase that section of the rail line to help with um, a housing development that they're planning um, because they're trying to house their employees and they're struggling with it. So um, this is uh, an opportunity to help out a local business and show support to them um, to help uh, essentially grow our industrial community in town as well. So um, it doesn't actually affect us. We're just giving support. Um, we're not actually closing it until CN Rail makes that decision. So I'm just asking for council support tonight. Does anyone have any questions? Councillor Luciani. Um, through, through you to, uh, I guess, to Sivas in regards to uh, how does, the, does this affect the, uh, everything that's been going on up to this point as far as supporting uh, the rail line and is this would this be an issue? Uh, through the mayor to uh, Council Luciani, I certainly am supportive of uh, Mike and Sandy Clover, and of course, they're big um, investors in our town as well. I would like to say that I think that the request is a bit premature um, in the sense that we've just reopened this line uh, as of January of last year. And uh, while their lands may not be available for development, the lands the line uh, does extend past the property as well. So I think that when we're looking at supporting the viability of this line. I would say that we should leave all options on the table at this point. I haven't seen any information that suggests that this would this line would stop their development. So I'm unsure as to what the concern really is. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? I think the line is an operation to towns and lumber, am I correct? Yes, Madam Mayor. Uh, right now, their their last customer on the line, if you will, is Towns and Lumber. The line does extend a number of kilometers past that. That's correct. Councillor Parker, uh, through you, Mayor Gilvezi, to Cephas. How many other industrial lands are um, past that uh, the land that Titan Trailers currently owns, or the Clover Zone? Through Madam Mayor to uh, Councillor Parker, I, I don't have the answer to that. I wasn't expecting a motion in this regard. Um, so um, what I will note is that when we did the analysis uh, at the beginning of this process, there was over a thousand acres along this line, most of it to the east. Um, and so I, I'm not sure there's other parcels of land in this area, but uh, I would have to look into that. Thank you. Councillor Lucini. Just um, just a comment that it, it, I'm not too sure whether this has gone to economic development already or whether they've had any comment on it, but I know that they were supporting SCORE before doing what they were doing as far as the rail, I believe. Um, I'm just wondering whether this shouldn't just be deferred uh, to, to another meeting till we get a little bit more information. 
there is a score meeting coming up this week. That's why I was trying to get it on the agenda for now. So that's that. That's why it's here tonight. The agenda did come out for score, so I don't. It's Thursday. The score meetings in th on Thursday, so I'm not sure if it'll make it or not. So, Council Councilor Luciani, you had your hand up. Yeah, I'm just wondering about making a motion to defer. Yeah, we can defer it. Um, uh, you need to put the motion on the floor to defer with a seconder. Yeah, I'll make a motion to defer a seconded by Councillor Parsons. Okay, so you're deferring it, but you're sending it to economic development. Is that the intention? That's a refer. The clerk is telling me that's a refer. <laughs> R&D. Okay, refer. <laughs> it's getting late, right? <laughs> okay, so now we have vote. We've got a mover and a seconder, and we vote on the refer to ECDEF. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. So it's going to active. So now we move to a finance 13.4, council remuneration and expenses. Is Renato presenting? Sheena? You know, like there's a report. It's just who do we ask questions to? So um, there's a report that we've all read. Do you have any further comments to the council remuneration and expenses? Good evening, council. Um, no additional comments other than this is just an annual report that is presented uh, for the Municipal Act, and it includes all remuneration and expenses incurred by council in execution of council's duties. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions or comments from Council? Seeing none, uh, Councillor Parsons has a resolution. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's moved by, where is it? It's moved by myself, second by Councillor Parker. The Council receives report FIN 2306-2022, Council Remuneration and Expense Report as information. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? And that would be unanimous. Okay, so 13.5 uh, fire and emergency services, and we have an agreement. Um, staff want to make any comments? This is uh, fantastic. Fire Chief? Now, through you, Mayor of Lazy Council, this is a good news item. This is uh, so uh, I will be quick. I know it's evening's a little long in the tooth, but uh, uh, the recurrent 911 system uh, has reached end of life and is uh, must be replaced. The CRTC has mandated that all communication centers or PSAPs um, must upgrade to the new next generation 911 technology standards. Uh, this new 911 technology will enable things like text to 911, video to 911, and advanced GPS location uh, information, which will enhance the current 911 system. Uh, the mayor and the CAO uh, met with the Solicitor General, as well as other government officials, uh, to advocate on council's behalf um, for our share of the NG 911 funding. Uh, the mayor and the councils, with council's help, uh, was successful in acquiring a $1.245 million uh, investment in NG911 through the Solicitor General's uh, TPON transfer payment uh, to upgrade the 911 standards. Um, the Ontario government has committed $208 million over three years, so $80 million uh, from 2022 to 2023, 80 million from 2023 to 2024, and then 48 million from 2024 to 2025 to help fund the transition of the 911 system. 
as council knows, operating a PSAP can be a very costly um, adventure to operate and maintain, particularly with rapid advancement in technology. So this funding opportunity is welcome news for the town of Tilsonburg. Um, we'd, all, we'd like to thank the Ontario government for recognizing the sig significant impact on budgets upgrading it to NG911 standards has on smaller communities like Tilsonburg uh, and thank them again for this funding commitment. Uh, the province currently funds 100% of EMS and OPP communication centers and we would like to see this funding support continue for municipal PSAPs into the future. Earlier this month, uh, the province announced Tilsonburg's share of the 2023, so 2022-2023 grant in the amount of $1.245 million uh, for eligible NG911 expenses occurred, incurred between that time. So we've been attempting to identify um, all eligible expenses incurred during this time period and want to acquire as much goods and services related to 911 as possible to offer to uh, recover uh, as much as possible from this funding opportunity. Uh, the report lists the broad description of the eligible expenses the town can submit for under this application. Given the extremely time tight frames involved, the report recommendations ask that uh, the mayor and clerk execute the agreement um, to open up access to this funding and council grant the fire chief authority to purchase NG911 related equipment services, enter into agreements, including sole sourcing where necessary to maximize the recovery of this provincial funding opportunity. Our goal is to recapture as much of this 1.245 million uh, in eligible expenses for 2023 or 2022 and 2023 as humanly possible. Uh, the 2023, 2024, transfer payment guidelines should be announced shortly and hopefully uh, allows for more appropriate timelines and guidance. And I'd be happy to take any questions council has. Councilor Parsons. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, a very good report, Chief. As you say, a good news report. Uh, my question is, uh, where was this funding going to come from with, without the grant? Uh, was this within the current or in the 10-year forecast uh, for, for, the, for us to fund through taxation? Uh, for you, Madam Mayor, to Councillor Parsons. So essentially what we were gonna do was charge back our customers. So our partners in our communication partner alliance. So we would fund it. And then quite frankly, the, uh, through the shared partnership agreement, we would all pay for these infrastructure costs. Just continuing, and, and and we ourselves pay part of that for our own customers here in Tilsburg. Um, there'd be a levy against uh, our, our our own folks in, in Tilsburg in our own budget. Is that correct? We, we'll have some savings, in other words. Uh, through the mayor to the council, absolutely, we will have some significant savings with this funding opportunity for sure. Anyone else? This is excellent news. Um, just looking to see. Councillor Spencer, you have the resolution. Uh, thank you. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Rosehart. That report, FRS 23 02, titled TPON Agreement Execution, be received. And that a bylaw to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute the transfer payment agreement for the town of Tilsonburg Fire <coughs> and Rescue Services, Fire Communications, PSA. PNG 911 agreement be presented to council for consideration and that the fire chief be authorized to purchase NG 911 related goods services and enter <clears throat> into a NG 911 agreements required to maximize eligible recapture of 9G 111 costs. I think I said too many ones there. Included sole sourcing where necessary to ensure timely acquisition in standardization with existing hardware, software, and services, and that the fire chief be authorized to complete Schedule E, financial report next generation funding for the transfer payment agreement on behalf of the corporation in order to maximize the recovery of all eligible NG911 related costs. Thank you. 
Thank, thank you. Any questions further from Council Member mm -hmm. How long will this be long, good for? Like what you're upgrading, how long will it be good for? Uh, you, Madam Mayor, to Council Rosehart. Uh, it's hard to say, quite frankly. Uh, the technology changes uh, rapidly in this space, but uh, this should, I mean, the last one was in place for 30 years, but uh, we didn't have the consistent technology we've seen, but uh, I, I would expect it would be in place for a while. Now, follow up, Madam Mayor, through you to the speaker. So would there be a clause now that we would put in all contracts that we would have some kind of a buffer zone? to recapture something down the road if it happens again to us, if we need upgrading? Uh, we may go to, to Council Rosehart. Yeah, we, we, we have a standard clause in the current agreement that allows for recapture of stuff like this. But having said that, with the government uh, paying for or funding this model, it's been a, a welcome surprise for us. Anyone else? Yeah, it's fantastic news. Um, great job for putting a good application in that was successful. Um, so I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Uh, that's carried with none opposed. We, now we are moving on to um, 13.6, Operations and Development, Lot Maintenance Bylaw, and I'll turn that over to Jonathan. Thank you. Through you, Madam Mayor, the consideration before you is to um, and the recommendation it reflects the clean and the cleaning of lands and clearing of refuge dead and decaying trees it's essentially uh, a housekeeping item as it relates to our clean yard bylaw 3810 uh, that was considered in council in august 2021 um, and there's an appendicized schedule of these sections that have been changed or and or expanded upon uh, furthermore upon our uh, public consultation period sent out, we had two notices come back, generally seeking clarification on the proposal and one on authority. Barring any specific questions, I'll open the uh, floor for comments or questions. Questions from Council? Council Parsons? Yes, thank you. And it's uh, it's an excellent document. It uh, moves our community forward, I believe, in terms of some of the, um, maybe the ongoing complaints that the town receives from time to time and doesn't have the tools to resolve them. My, a couple questions. One is, um, does this uh, pose any concern about, because with rules, there's enforcement. So is there going to have to be more enforcement relative to this? Or I, I believe a big, a big part of this is education. We educate the community about these rules, but I wonder if there's going to be more costs relative to enforcement. Sorry. Through you, Madam Mayor, to Council of Parsons. Um, generally, the approach in the bylaw enforcement component is this is a housekeeping matter. Although we had many components that we were cleaning up in terms of standards today, it was more of a consolidation into our maintenance. So these are items that are usually seen on site when we're in there for other infractions. So it generally is assumed that we won't be increasing the expenditures. Um, however, we do have an annual, we should be annually reviewing our bylaws to bring them up to snuff for today and the expectations for the general council. Uh, if there's an impact, that would certainly come back for council's consideration through budgetary process. MESH offers us a wealth of information in terms of capturing some of the activities, and we have a great resource in allocating that over to staff in terms of time. Uh, so those are annual uh, discussions that we'll have through the budget conversation. Just a, a subsequent question. Uh, I can't see it right now in this document, but it, it talks about the cargo um, containers that can be on a property uh, 30 days after the sale of a property. And I think that's what people put their furniture into to move. Um, what, what about people that are moving into a home that are bringing their container? I don't see any allowance for people to have their container after they, because they don't always move on, you know, when, when the property sells. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And that is a good point of clarity. I will investigate further, but I think in one breath, we would expect that that's a reasonable uh, request from the resident moving in. But uh, if we do need to circle back, I will certainly uh, clean up the wording for sure. And certainly note it for the next time we revisit this. Thank you, good questions. Anyone else? Seeing none, Councillor Luciani, you have the resolution. 
Yeah, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Spencer that a bylaw to provide for the cleaning and clearing of land, clearing of refuse, uh, dead and decayed trees, graffiti, storage of commercial motor vehicles and recreational vehicles and yard sales be brought forward for Council's consideration. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? And that would be carried. All those opposed? Councillor Rosa, I just need to confirm that you're, you were in favor of? Madam Mayor, I had a question. Oh, sorry, I didn't mm -hmm. see. I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. I was just wondering, on yard sales is, or garage sales you got in here, is there a limit of how many a person can have? Uh, th through Madam Mayor to uh, Councilor Rosehart, I believe it is two or three per year, two per calendar year. And who would monitor that? That would be through our bylaw enforcement in terms of noted activity. Um, it's a little bit discretionary in terms of when the first call would be received of if it's an infraction, infraction based on the third time they had it. So we would always give the benefit to the resident unless there's clear, uh, unless we can clearly defend. Remember, these all have to go to the courts if we if we go through that avenue. So we have to clearly defend that we've noted two or more in order for us to get there. So it would probably draw the line in the sand around the second one. And then we'd look at the uh, activity that could be on site. So it is driven by bylaw complaints uh, in the lines share, unless we know of habitual issues, which we can uh, look at more frequently. Follow up, Madam Mayor. Is, is that really a big concern, yard sales in the town of Tilsenburg? It has been noted for general housekeeping. Um, in terms of complaints, I could look into that further and provide communication to council if that would be sufficient. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So I do need to clarify if you're in favor or opposed, <laughs> in favor. So that was unanimous. Thank you. Um, recreation, culture, and parks. Uh, Julie, do you have any comments on your report? No. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's um, council had given direction to staff to report back on the land acknowledgement, and the report is showing the findings of my research. Thank you. Council, have any questions? Seeing none, Councillor Parker. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Spencer, that report RCP 23-16 land acknowledgement update be received as information. Thank you. All those in favor? And that's carried. Councillor Parker, advisory committee minutes. Um, I would actually put a motion to defer on both of these until the minutes are updated um, because I don't think that they've been circulated and there were some discrepancies in both minutes. So um, bring them back for the next meeting. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Rose. Our motion to defer or refer, defer or refer on this one. What's a defer? Defer. defer right? Am I correct? Uh, defer to the next meeting. Yes, yeah, so typically these are just here, minutes, sorry, through the mayor to the councillors for procedural wise, these are just in front of you, not for ratification, but rather so that you're aware uh, the bodies themselves would ratify the minutes if there were noted comments that needed to be changed. So the advisory committee minutes would be dealt with individually by those committee minutes. It's here just so you're aware of the activities that are going on. Okay, so the, the question with this is they haven't actually physically been back to the committee for comment yet. Uh, through the mayor to the councillor, I'm still learning your processes as you're uh, you know, three months on the job clerk, but that is typically your practice here is that you're putting the minutes in front of council uh, just as information and then they get ratified at the committee and already noted. So there is a possibility that they change between council and when they're actually at the advisory committees. But certainly if you have concerns, then I would suggest just not voting on these and they'd be returned when they're amended. We will, we will put a motion to defer on, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Rosehart. Any questions, concerns? All those in favor to defer? Uh, that's unanimous and carried. So those will come back once they go to the committee and the committee takes a look at them. Uh, Tilsenberg Police Service Board minutes, Councillor Rosart. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Spencer, that Council receives the Police Service Board minutes dated January 18, 2023 as information. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor. Questions? Seeing none, call the vote. All those in favor? And that would be carried. Uh, notice the motions, Councillor Parker. I'm going to pull the one that is on on currently um, due to the fact that there was other information that was not correct earlier when I put it on the floor. So I would like to remove this one from the floor and I do have a second one that I'd like to read. Um, and it's actually just a notice of motion um, that uh, an option for a roundabout traffic light or other measure, measures at Durham Drive and Quarter Town Line be investigated to ensure the utmost safety will be achieved in the vicinity of Westfield Public School and that this forms part of the Tilsonburg Transportation Master Plan and that the concerns highlighted in the paradigm traffic study from the Performance Realty Corporation be included in uh, the Transportation Master Plan as well. Okay, thank you. So that'll be dealt with that at the next meeting. So next. Yes, yeah. can you just forward that to Amelia? That would be yeah, great. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay, Councillor Luciani. Yeah, move on by self and seconded by Councillor Rosehart that a bylaw to amend bylaw 2020-091 being a bylaw to adopt and maintain a policy with respect to the delegation of the Corporation of the Town of Tilsonburg powers and duties and bylaw to amend bylaw 4019 being a bylaw to regulate and control the granting of encroachments on uh, highways and public land within the Town of Tilsonburg and a bylaw to authorize a transfer payment agreement, Fire and Rescue Services Communications PSAP and a bylaw to uh, provide for the cleaning and clearing of land, clearing of Refuge, uh, dead and decayed trees, graffiti, storage, and uh, commercial motor vehicles and recreational vehicles and yard sales be read for a first, second, third, and final reading, and that the mayor and clerk be and are hereby authorized to sign the same in place of corporate seal thereunto. Councillor Parsons. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. It's, uh, I'd like to move uh, by myself, seconded by Councillor Spencer, that the bylaw to amend bylaw 4019 being a bylaw to regulate and control the granting of encroachments on highways and public land within the town of Tilsonburg be dealt with separately. Okay, so council, what we're looking to do is take out the second paragraph, just to remove that and deal with it separately. So first we're voting, we're voting on the motion to separate. Questions, concerns? I'll call the vote. All those in favor. So that's unanimously carried. So now um we're dealing so now do we deal with this one or the rest of it all bylaws, all bylaws not separate. okay so now we're going back to councillor luciani's resolution minus the second paragraph any questions concerns so we're voting on paragraph one three and four all those in favor and that would be carried and now we are going to uh councillor parsons Thank you, Madam Mayor. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Spencer, that the bylaw to amend bylaw 4019, being a bylaw to regulate and control the granting of encroachments on highways and public land within the town of Tilsmerg, be amended to strike the following words from section one, bullet point two. I quote, that are stamped and sealed by a professional engineer, end quote. I'd like to speak. Go ahead. If I could. Um, so uh, we are dealing currently with the uh, the onset of the uh, patio season uh, that begins. Uh, that's the patio season for restaurants in the service of food and beverage in Tilsonburg. It starts on April 15th. And um, there was a, a, a resolution come to council last meeting uh, where the BIA uh, wanted to uh, put together or offer to those restaurateurs uh, the opportunity to have a patio and it was going to be funded 75 percent by the BIA and uh, since that time there have been uh, other other points of view expressed where where people may want to uh, have their own patio so in that original BIA, uh, BIA report that came to council I don't, I don't know how the wording got in there but it was about the engineer stamped um, engineer stamp design if you will and uh, 
we are going to need some time to investigate this further. So we want to give people, uh, restaurant owners in Tulsaburg, an opportunity to continue as though they were um, perhaps through COVID, uh, but following, uh, you know, the uh, the new alcohol gaming uh, rules, for example, that only allows a, a license for eight months, they'll have to follow that. They're still going to have to uh, follow the AOD regulations and uh, um, stipulations by uh, the building department and uh, public health for example and uh, so we're going to need some time to come back with the uh, a per what we call a permanent patio uh, program thank you thank you i just want to clarify when you say we you're talking about the the bia excuse me i i shouldn't be using the word we i am the chair of the bia we had a, a meeting this morning a kind of a emergency meeting to have this discussion because timing was important so i it was not we here right <laughs> Just wanted to clarify for the rest of council. Uh, any questions or concerns? Councilor Parker. Would it not make more sense to defer this bylaw till more information can come back versus um, just striking stamped and sealed professional engineer? I thank you. We we've we've had a lot of discussion today on that, whether we would take that course of action, but it's it's really important for the restaurant owners to have the opportunity to move forward. And there are a number of uh, restaurant owners that have expressed an interest to carry on with the uh, pop-up patio program. So we'd, we'd like to really keep it moving forward, but have the time to uh, to come up with a better, no, it's not we, excuse me. The BIA would like to have the time to come up with the uh, a, a more uh, a, a, a more improved policy. Thank you. And Jonathan, did you want to make a comment? Um, through your worship and just for council's consideration, there are other provisions as it relates to the Alcohol and Gaming Commission that need this bylaw to be endorsed in order for the program to be here. So if there's a suggestion, it would be to st strike this one component because it's not governed by the over overriding legislation, but rather move ahead with some of the provisions, especially related to AODA. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? Okay, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Carried. And then uh, Councillor Parsons, right back to you. Thank you. Moved by myself, second by count, uh, Councillor Spencer. The bylaw to amend bylaw 4019, being a bylaw to regulate and control the granting of encroachments on highways and public land within the town of Tilsonburg as amended, be read for a first, second, and third, and final reading, and the mayor and the clerk be and are hereby authorized to sign the same and place the corporate seal thereunto. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any questions? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? and carry. Councilor Rosart. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Moved by myself, second by Councilor Parker, that bylaw 2023-032 to confirm the proceedings of council meeting held on March 27, 2023, be read for the first, second, third, and final reading and that the mayor and the clerk be and are hereby authorized to sign the same and place the corporate seal thereunto. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Questions? I'll call the vote. All those in favor? That would be carried. Items of public interest, Cephas? Councillor Spencer? Um, just congratulations to Team Tilsenberg who brought home the gold medal for Special Olympics. Um, had the pleasure of playing against the team lead William at the community uh, curling bond spill uh, back in December. Uh, quite an incredible curler. So uh, congrats to all there. Thanks. So I saw that on Facebook. It's uh, thank you for bringing that forward. Councilor Rosart. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, to you to uh, uh, Julie, I have a question. I had a few phone calls this morning about the complex keeping the pool open for another two weeks. They got noticed this morning at 10 o'clock. A few of them were a little upset because they'd ever gone other places and already purchased the right to stay there and swim. And then they heard that the pool here is going to be open for another two weeks. Is is it two weeks or four weeks or is it going to be closed in two weeks? <laughs> they weren't very happy this morning. Through you, Madam Mayor, to did you want to take it? Is that what you're telling me? Go ahead. Through you, Madam Mayor, to Councillor Rosehart. Um, yes, the there was some last minute adjustments that we were working on for the um, uh, schedule. Uh, we were working with staff on Friday. 
Uh, we had confirmation today to move ahead with that. Uh, council were notified as soon as we were made aware and uh, we sent that out uh, to all our members. Um, it is right now taking us to April 8th, uh, bringing forward um, an update on April 11th at council meeting. So we will have the pool open until April 8th for programming and AquaFit and fitness classes. We do apologize to the community. It wasn't our intention. Um, we're reacting very quickly to the pool situation. So um, I know Andrea fielded a lot of calls as well, and uh, there was some apology shared with them. We're working with Ingersoll as well. Uh, they're taking on some of the supplementary activities. Uh, so they're aware of the situation as well. So my apologies to anyone that was affected by that. And I do follow up. There, there was no way well, we could send it out. Oh, sorry. The, clerk, the clerks informed me that item, items of public interest are items of public interest and there can't be debate. So, <laughs> sorry. So anyways, <laughs> the clerks inform me. Um, maybe if you do have some questions or concerns, you could email them to uh, Director Columbus. Councilor Burke. Uh, I got a couple of things. Uh, first is yesterday was uh, Purple Day. Um, it's a day to celebrate or to to raise awareness for epilepsy. Um, and it's usually typically um, done by Epilepsy Southwestern Ontario. So our clock tower was per, or is has been purple all month for Epilepsy Awareness Month. So if it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to learn more about it and bring awareness to the community. Um, the other that I had is uh, I'd like to send congratulations to the U11B, the U13C, the U15B and the U18B boys uh, Tilsonburg minor hockey teams who will be representing Tilsonburg at the OMHA championships uh, this coming weekend and next weekend um, in municipalities outside of Tilsonburg. So um, they will be traveling to Barrie and Windsor to uh, compete and we wish them luck. Thank you very much. I also did see that on Facebook as well. There was quite a list of them. Kyle? Yes, Madam Mayor, thank you very much. I'm happy to announce that our Director of Finance slash Treasurer, Sheena, has returned from Mat Leave. So welcome back, Sheena. We're happy to have you at our first council meeting. Clerk? <laughs> nope. Councilor Luciani, Councilor Parsons. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Nope, that's good. I've got nothing to add. <laughs> Oh, you do have something. Go ahead. Just two quick announcements for council and the community. Um, the, we want to say thank you to everyone for the outdoor rink. It has officially closed um, and we had a very busy season out there, but we had our longest season ever. So great job to the team over at TCC to maintain that facility. Um, and I also wanted to let the community and council know that this weekend is the Tilsonburg figure skating show. So there's two shows on Saturday. If anyone's looking for something to do, it's a great opportunity to support the figure skating club. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll be looking to Councillor Parsons for adjournment. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Spencer that the council meeting of March 27, 2023 be adjourned at 9.59 p.m. Thank you. It was a long one. All those in favor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>